<laughs> Hello. Okay. Logan clear.
Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second transport-themed half-day seminar under the Energy Lab banner. This follows the success of last year's seminar, which was uh, sustainable road transport. I am Richard Grant, a professor in the Department of Mechanical and Marine Engineering here at the Western Norway University of Applied Sciences, or HVL. I will be your compare for the first half of this afternoon's programme. In this seminar, there will be a little audience participation uh, to stop you falling asleep uh, through the use of Slido. Uh, through this, you can ask questions for the discussion session, which will happen later. You can also rank questions you see within Slido. So if somebody has put something you are particularly keen on hearing an answer to, you can promote it up the list. We will have a poll of questions to start things off. Uh, and uh, we're going to ask uh, a question. Cool. So to use uh, Slido, you just get your mobile device out and you put in slido.com in your web browser, and you will see a hash, and then you put in HVL transport thereafter. Now, you don't have to answer the question right away. You can have a little time to ponder things over, uh, as we'll be showing the results of the poll uh, in the discussion session, although we might uh, give you a sneak preview to see what's going on uh, as we go through. Now, uh, the Dean, Geir Anton Johansson, opened last year's seminar, and he was set to honour us with his presence uh, this time. Uh, he contacted me a short time ago to say that he would, had to address another audience with a lady called Erna Solberg. <laughs> I fear that we have been upstaged. The, so from my perspective, I now turn to the next most important person in the building the head of Department of Mechanical and Marine Engineering, and my boss. And I thank him in advance for making the opening address at this half-day seminar on sustainable marine transport. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Nils Otter Antonsen. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As you uh, heard, everybody above my pay grade is following the Prime Minister, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, I'm a little bit nervous to uh, speak after a native, native Oxford-speaking post-Brexit professor, <laughs> but uh, I think it might be uh, okay. I will do my best. Um, there is a story um, about the Norwegian painter, Edvard Munch. He was not that good in English. He was very bad in English, by the way. He knew German fluently. But he was asked one time to open an exhibition in London, and they persuaded him to do it. And he held a short speech, speech and in the end he said, I wish the exhibition hell. And of course, he talked about the Norwegian or hell, which means good luck. And that is something else. <laughs> so, we'll see if I'm uh, lucky with mine. Um, this, the, the photo uh, and the slides here, they are prepared by Dr. Limen, sitting over there. So, all credits to him for this. And um, there are a few slides, just to give you... Um, and um, start on what's uh, going to be discussed uh, today or give you some background. Um, we have the, um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I'm sure you all are familiar with the 17 goals and the 169 targets that the world has agreed on. And it's very um, seldom that uh, so many countries can agree about anything, but they have agreed about this one. And this is the world's uh, work agenda, which aims to end poverty, to protect the planet, and to ensure prosperity for all within 2030. And so we have 10 and a half years to do it. And that can be uh, very tricky. 
they are, of course, all of them are uh, uh, mutually dependent on each other. So it's difficult to solve one without the other, and, and so on. But the ones that are highlighted here are maybe more um, into um, the marine area, if you can say that. So what about uh, Norway? Um, and this is the, um, some uh, slide showing you the, uh, the national greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, in total up here, we, uh, we uh, emit about uh, 54 or 55 um, million tons CO2 every year. And I remember that there was something called the Kyoto Protocol in the uh, 11th of December 1997, where they agreed that everybody should uh, reduce their um, CO2 emissions by 5.8% in the period between eight, uh, 2008 and 2012. Um, actually, Norway was allowed to uh, increase by 1%, and we took advantage of that and increased by 8%, to be sure. And uh, so we are, we, we are not, we are still here. You see, it has gone a little bit up and not down. In transport, it looks a little bit better. So something happened in the last years here. Um, so that's good. So let's hope that uh, this time we uh, are serious when we say that we are going to reduce uh, the CO2 emissions. And we are going to do it properly. I, I should also mention that uh, in order to get this in perspective, how much uh, CO2, uh, CO2 we are uh, uh, putting out in the air, there is a, a power plant, uh, Niederhausen, in Germany, um, that um, uh, puts out 27 million tons, half of Nor Norway's emission every year. And that is only the third biggest polluter in Europe. There are two that are even worse. So, to put it in perspective, these numbers. So, if, if this uh, coal plant in, uh, in Germany could, uh, could be more 20% more effective and uh, then we could, uh, they could cut everything that we have here. So, the numbers are very big when we are talking about coal. Uh, <coughs> Renewable energy uh, will, uh, of course, be uh, very important if we are going to get the uh, reduction that we all hope for. Um, we, we didn't have much. This is the fraction of renewable energy. Um, uh, <coughs> in the transport sector, and um, I don't know what happened here when it went down, that I'm not sure about to explain, but um, this is approximately where I bought my electric car, so that could explain <laughs> the rest. Okay, I was not alone, there was a lot of people who bought electric cars, and then there were some ferries, at least uh, one that came in 2015, I think, so that could explain it. <coughs> and uh, also here you see uh, where, where do we uh, where do these uh, emissions come from in transport? This is the, the biggest one. Not everything here is in English, but this biggest one is in road transport, and the uh, the coastal transport is here. This is air, and the other is on uh, on rails. So we will be talking uh, today, I think, about this this one that's here and maybe also uh, the one that is, uh, uh, that is in the Norwegian economic zone, because that is not coastal, uh, we should also take that into account. Uh, and the, the green here, that is um, traffic that's in the Norwegian economic zone, and, and the, the dots here, that's the number of ships that you have. And everybody's talking about the crews, they are here. They don't pollute that much, but they are uh, not that many uh, ships either. Uh, so, this is the, the wet dry bulk, and that is maybe the difficult one to do something with. Uh <coughs> when we are talking about uh, uh, electric ferries, then we are talking about short distances. Um, if we are going to do something with the transatlantic shipping, then it's a total different ballgame, and we don't have that technology yet. It has to be developed. <coughs> Maybe um, 
Hydrogen could be the solution, I don't know. This is just some examples of what's happened so far. We have um, had uh, LNG um, car ferries for the domestic and international use. And of course, that reduces also the CO2 emissions. And we have had uh, fuel cells uh, for uh, at least for uh, auxiliary power. And we, of course, we have had this electric um, uh, passenger um, uh, car ferries. And uh, also there has been um, some uh, electric fishing boats that they have tried. And, uh, and uh, uh, if, the, if the battery technology um, continues to develop, that could really be something for, for uh, the fishermen. At least the one who's at the coastal and fishing. And what is going to happen, then uh, we see that uh, we heard uh, earlier this morning about Nurled and their first ferry that will be on um, uh, hydrogen, on liquid hydrogen. Uh, and that can be an interesting uh, uh <coughs> project to see if it is feasible or not. And, uh, and they can solve some problems with this. And uh, because if you are going to, uh, to go transatlantic, I think uh, we can, you can forget about the batteries. Uh, but maybe hydrogen can, could be something. I'm sure we're going to hear something about that today. So today's seminar, should you just run quickly through it, and you can see here, um, there will be um, um, a number of um, interesting speakers here, uh, both from um, uh, Norway and from abroad. Um, I don't think we'd have time to go through everything. We just uh, skip over that, but you see it. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I, I can mention that uh, in the end, why didn't it do it like I, I wanted to? Go back. Ah, you go back, yes, that's a good one. Um, opportunity to visit the Marine Lab, I should maybe should be mentioned uh, in the end here. If there is somebody who is interested in uh, taking a tour to our Marine Lab, they can just uh, follow uh, Probably it will be Gloria here, uh, and uh, that will be possible after when it's finished here. So, thank you for your uh, attention, and I wish you all the best for the seminar. Well, thank you, Nils, for your opening words, which were very well received. Let you tidy up a bit. Well, today's seminar is housed in the wonderful state-of-the-art buildings here at uh, HVL. Uh, 81 boreholes and uh, salt tanks to manage the energy uh, within the building on nights and days. Uh, this is a seat of learning for Norway's talented young students. Education from bachelor through master's to doctoral level is what we do here. So as a prelude to today's invited speakers, I give you Gloria Stenfeld from the Department of Mechanical and Marine Engineering at HVL to briefly say some words about our marine education provision. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> this was very high. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, I will give a brief introduction to what we do here at HVL within marine technology. Um, the outline will be I speak a bit about the campus and study programs and about education and our research interests, the lab facilities and then mainly our marine lab. Uh, our campuses Maybe you have seen this before, but we have several campuses, but now we got some new applications, so maybe it will be not so many students in Flora and Kristiansund, but our main campuses are in Bergen and Haugesund. So that's where the mechanical and marine department is located. Our bachelor programs are in mechanical, marine, industrial and energy and ocean technology and engineering. So we have five bachelor programs and the mechanical engineering is also located in Haugesund. Uh, the ocean technology is divided into two spe specializations, aquaculture and subsea. And uh, my focus will be on marine technology, 
technology today. We also collaborate uh, on master level with uh, three master programs, with uh, one with UIB, the energy technology program, which is towards thermal engines. And then we have the master in subsea technology with NTNU. And the new one since 2017 is the master in ocean technology that we have together with UIB. So there we have uh, students coming and doing their master project within marine installations and they do that for a year here in our marine lab. So that's our responsibility to take those students. And uh, 2018 we got a new PhD program in computer science at the computer department. So we also have a, a PhD student there doing work on materials. Uh, the courses we have in marine technology, now I'm only talking about marine technology, not all the other bachelor programs. Uh, I will not go into details, but we have uh, the basic courses are these highlighted in darker color. We do ship stability, hydrodynamics and uh, offshore rules and standards, of course, uh, how to moor anchoring and a bit about hydrodynamic lift also, because we are interested in hydrofoil technology <laughs> also. Uh, and the last year they have a course where we couple everything together and do analysis in the CSM software by DNVGL. Then the students take all the knowledge they have and put it into one uh, course and try to do analysis on actual uh, yeah, barges and uh, offshore structures like uh, floating wind turbines will be the next year project. Uh, we have done a big revision where we do future courses will be uh, mainly focused on CFD and experimental methods as well because we think uh, the industry has given us feedback that this is needed because there is not so much CFD knowledge on ship resistance right now. So this is something we have introduced now in the study plan. So students do all the work, uh, all from planning to building models, uh, yeah, looking like aliens <laughs> or astronauts, maybe. And uh, we have uh, ship resistance testing also within our courses. Uh, here are, is the typical ship resistance test. So they are very active and have full access to the tank while they do their bachelor project in the end, the third year. So now a bit about the research interests mainly. I know we have a, a new strategy, but uh, <laughs> this is still the areas that we do research in. Uh, so we are interested here mainly at the department in these three areas, ocean, energy and materials. And uh, there is a lot going on, we don't have time for everything, but these are our interests I have to highlight. Uh, energy and ocean is quite closely related through wave, tidal and floating wind turbines that we also do research on. And of course renewable ferries and ship performance, which is, I have put this under here, but of course it goes into the hydrogen part also, where we will have a new course in the fall on hydrogen technology. Um, mainly the important thing is that the re research should be relevant to the business and teaching, and in line with this we also build up our laboratories to match these interests and what we do. So I will talk a bit about our laboratories because they are quite many. Uh, I will focus on the marine lab, but I mention also that we have a mechanical workshop where we do all the machining, welding, lathe machining and everything that is needed to build models and different system and we have the materials lab where we do testing, fatigue testing of material in an instrument machine. 
We have an internal combustion lab where we have engines, Stirling engines and a Volkswagen engine. Do a lot of, uh, there is a lot of research going on on renewable fuel systems there, how to reduce fuel emissions. And new from this year is that we also have a 3D lab because we have a new 3D scanner where we actually can scan the boats that we have built and see that this actually is the same shape as the CAD drawing that we have designed the ship in. So this is very nice and new for us. So the marine lab. Uh, you will have time to go down <laughs> later. <laughs> I will not focus so much on this, but it's 50 meter long, three meter wide and 2.2 meter deep. There is a wave generator at one end making waves. And we also have a towing carriage that can go very quick, five meters per second, which is not <laughs> for ships. <laughs> we don't attach a ship to that speed, but we uh, have designed it also to be able to do tidal turbine testing and other type of testing that needs more speed, requires more speed. We have a nice beach that absorbs the waves at the end so you don't get wet when you stand at the <laughs> end of the tank. <laughs> That's quite important. So when we have big, sw big waves coming there, they are just disappearing. We also have a constant force falling weight system where we tow our ships on a yeah, it's just a falling weight system, pulley system, and that's the traditional system we tow ships with. The projects that we are working on right now uh, are both master and uh, bachelor projects, which are connected to our research and development. And uh, we are doing a lot with uh, Equinor now with the high wind project both on how to install and in uh, Haugesund they are also already looking on how to take away <laughs> wind turbines that are out decommissioning of turbines because some of them have already been out there for 30 years so they have to be replaced. Uh, we look at um, how you tow the system out if there are any vibrations when you tow the cylinder through water. We have uh, egg, uh, the egg, you maybe recognize they are very good at doing reclame, uh, commercial water. <laughs> good. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it's a lot of fish farming projects now, both with the marine construction AS and this Hauge Aqua and Norse. And also with Roxel, there is a more net type fish farming uh, also. And uh, we have a project on hydrofoils where maritime engineering wants to do hydrofoil, uh, put hydrofoils on their fish, uh, on their Arbeids working boats going out to offshore fish farms. Uh, so there's a lot going on, but mainly, of course, we, I don't have a picture, but we, most things we do are ship resistance testing. Uh, is ship resistance testing in our tank. So here are some videos. Uh, here is the, a project with installing, it's very light here. There's a cylinder placed here. Very light. I'll take that again. So, so it illustrates how to, uh, um, yeah, transport the high wind system out and loosen it from a barge, and we measure the forces if there is a collision between the monopile and the barge. So that's the a master project. Then we have the closed fish farm, uh, the egg where we look at sloshing inside. There are very big forces inside this egg. And uh, we look a bit at how the fish will feel inside there, if that they don't get seasick. <laughs> and of course, also the mooring forces are quite big uh, on this 
these kind of systems that are closed uh, compared with those who are net based. <coughs> and here is the vortex induced motion of the, it should <laughs> represent the high wind monopile when they tow it out to the sea. We have looked at that interaction and then we typically do a lot of these type of tests with ship resistance and looking at splashing on how much water, wet water comes up on the top of the boat. And uh, this, this is no video, but this is our new research area where we want to also work together with Stratclyde, with uh, Gregory Payne uh, working on tidal turbines. So that's very interesting. So these are our industry partners that we have had through many years. Um, we don't work with them every year, but they come and go and have projects then and then. So it's a quite a lot of interesting companies, both close by and also now we have good communication with Stratclyde. It's very nice. Um, yes. And you can always contact us if you want to do something in our lab. Uh, Nils Otter is always available <laughs> at his office. <laughs> but uh, me as well. Uh, I'm the study coordinator for the marine technology program as well. And then we have Dr. David Landesudal, who is uh, uh, responsible for the master collaboration with UIB uh, for the ocean technology. And then we have Jan Bartel, who is quite new, and he will take over the responsibility for the marine lab. I don't yet have a picture of him, sorry. <laughs> but the main uh, important thing is that you go into HVLN or EMM to get to our programs or marine lab to know more about marine lab, just slash marine lab. And finally, how inappropriate to call this planet Earth when it is quite clearly ocean. And uh, this connects also to the number 14 UN goal to preserve life under sea, under the waterline. So we are not only reducing emissions when we work with new transport, we are actually also reducing noise, hopefully. So we have to think about the creatures that live under the water. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Enlightening us all, the uh, education provision. And if there are any people from business here, from commerce, and you have any projects, you can always contact us. And indeed, also on a commercial basis as yes. well. If yes. We want to do user facilities here, which uh, is a state of the art uh, tank we've got here. Feet's hmm. going up to Trondheim. Eh? You, are w you are welcome. <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, I'm just uh, reminding you about the poll. I should have said this with a microphone, of course. I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, do I need to repeat all of this? Perhaps not. Uh, plus, please go to Slido and uh, visit the poll, answer the poll if you can, and also perhaps file some questions uh, as well. So to our next uh, speaker, uh, it's uh, directed towards hybrid propulsion solutions. Uh, I have uh, a hybrid car. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, I've got the right one? No, yes, okay. The first talk in today's proceedings is life cycle analysis uh, of marine transportation propulsion systems. Uh, we uh, have to welcome uh, Professor Perlin Zhu. Uh, he has kindly travelled uh, from Scotland to be with us today. 
He's a professor at the University of Strathclyde, uh, Department of Engineering, and I think your department had quite a long name. Uh, it's uh, Naval Architecture, Ocean and Marine Engineering, indeed. Uh, there will be an opportunity uh, to ask questions that are said by Slido. Uh, if we have some time before the break, we might uh, look at some questions. So please uh, file some questions. Uh, I give you Professor Zhu. Thank you very much, Richard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as introduced, uh, my name is uh, Pei Lin Zhou, come from uh, Strathclyde University in Glasgow. Uh, myself is, uh, come the department is called the Naval Architecture, Ocean and the Marine Engineering. Myself is a professor in Marine Engineering. Uh, my research has been for more than 20 years, mainly on this uh, uh, engine emission controls and lately developed into this uh, uh, shape of ballast water management and the treatment. However, uh, today's presentation topic is life cycle assessment uh, as a tool for the selection of uh, uh, propulsion system or even these uh, marine power systems. Uh, that's because uh, over the past 15 years, I participated in four European, large European projects. And in this large European project, uh, my main role has been uh, conducting this life cycle assessment, introducing this life cycle assessment into shipyard process, into this uh, shipping life cycle assessment process. So that's why, uh, that's what I'm going to present today. And I, I have to say, this is the first time over the past 15 years I presented this topic to the audience, okay? It's all my researchers that does this job here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll cover this uh, topic-wise, uh, the background, you know, uh, why shipping industry needs this uh, life cycle assessment and also this uh, introduction of uh, life cycle, very briefly, what's life cycle assessment and what's the life cycle cost assess assessment, that's the LCCA, and then risk assessment. Uh, finally, this uh, uh, multi cr multiple criteria decision analysis, okay. Then I'll show you some result of a uh, uh, case study. Uh, this uh, case study, uh, not only for this propulsion system selection and also for other uh, uh, applications for this uh, uh, shaping uh, industry, okay? Uh, uh, audience here, I'm sure, you know, from the first presenters and also from your uh, morning's program, you're probably familiar with these uh, 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 pictures here. The first one is, uh, no, I hope it's not moving yet. The first one is this uh, uh, IMO's uh, SOX emission control, okay, this SOX. So uh, to control this uh, SOX emission from shaping, IMO has reduced this, introduced these uh, uh, regulations by, you know, 2020s. In the open sea area, shape has to run with this fuel uh, with the sulfur concentration 0.5% sulfur concentration, which means uh, uh, with you burn this low sulfur concentration of fuel and also subsequently this uh, SOX emission is low. Alternatively, you can still burn this uh, high sulfur concentration fuel which is cheaper, but uh, you have to uh, do something in the exhaust system to reduce the sulfur emissions to the atmosphere, which is called uh, after treatment method. This red line shows this uh, uh, sulfur concentration uh, requirement for the fuel when you burn you burn in this uh, emission control area. Okay. Uh, this next picture shows that uh, this uh, SOX emissions compared with uh, from shipping, international shipping with this uh, land-based emissions. We can see that uh, some 30 years ago, uh, shipping's uh, SOX emission is far, far less than this uh, uh, land-based emission. However, due to this uh, increase of uh, shipping volume year by year, it's uh, increased level of emissions increasing. And then this emission level from land base is uh, reduces very sharply. Now they are more or less, you know, uh, meeting or even lower than this shape emissions levels, okay? Uh, due to various activities being taken, such as this, uh, uh, this power plant convert from a coal power plant to liquid fuel, from liquid fuel power plant to this uh, uh, alternative fuels uh, like uh, LNG, et cetera, okay? Um, the next slide is this NOx emission uh, regulations. Uh, this has been well-chewed topic already. Now uh, we are somewhere here. It's uh, 
LOX emission technology development is quite you know, settled now. Uh, in this emission control area, we are talking about this uh, very tough emission rule here, where you have to install uh, exhaust after treatment. Uh, in open sea, we are talking about tier two at this level. So this uh, engine parameter, operation parameter tuning uh, can meet this requirement. In anyway, so that's this uh, NOx emission level. Again, that's the land-based emissions and uh, this is shipping emissions. Again, this land-based emissions has been reduced uh, and catching up this, uh, or even better now than this uh, shipping emissions. Okay. So uh, there's so many technologies nowadays uh, being used uh, on ships for this uh, emission control. Okay, and and also for this uh, reduction of fuel consumptions, etc. Uh, so now this come to several things you have to consider when you build a ship. One is the cost, and the second is the emissions. Okay, and also there's the risk assessment, etc. So when all these things are combined together, we need this uh, multiple decision, multiple criteria decision making theory. Okay, so this is the example. This diagram seems better. Okay. Um, this example shows you these uh, different technologies for marine emission control. Uh, this uh, light blue, dark blue color is its capital cost, and this uh, red color is this uh, uh, operation cost uh, dealing with different uh, methodologies. Okay, uh, with all this combined together, it's very difficult for uh, decision maker to decide which technology to use and uh, and why. So that's why we introduce this. Uh, uh, life cycle uh, analysis si and, and also life cycle cost analysis. Okay. By definition, this uh, life cycle assessment uh, is a kind of a completions, uh, completions and the evaluation of this input, output, and then the potential environmental impacts of uh, products or system throughout this uh, life cycle. This life cycle cost assessment uh, is a method for assessing this total cost, which takes into account for all the costs uh, acquiring, owning, and uh, dip disposing of a product or system. And then risk assessment is a, a systematic process of evaluating this uh, potential risk that may be involved in uh, a projected activity or undertaking. So when all these things since added together, we have to use this uh, uh, multiple criteria decision making theory. Uh, now, this is a life cycle <laughs> analysis has been uh, considered to be a widely used evaluation method to determine the benefit or performance of product or a system from its uh, cradle, from its birth to its. Uh, uh, grave. Okay, that's the life cycle assessment. Uh, by theory, in practice, this life cycle assessment uh, can be applied uh, not from the cradle to grave. Could be a session of a process. That's what we depend on the data availability uh, and also the scope of your analysis. That's what we are doing. Okay, uh, uh, with the life cycle analysis, the life phase and the main activities of the product or system uh, will be identified and then the uh, related cost and the emissions will be determined, assessed. <coughs> With the help of decision making method, it's the, uh, it is feasible and uh, trustworthy way to evaluate the performance of the target. Okay. And uh, considering many different aspects of a target, uh, such as this uh, combined <coughs> nation of uh, environment, cost, and the risk impact, etc. Uh, the evaluation process could be uh, extensively uh, comprehensive and complicated as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the application of a life cycle assessment to uh, a propulsion system from uh, a shipyard installation uh, to this operation and then to this, uh, uh, and uh, during this operation we also continue the maintenance. After this uh, 20, 30 years, this lifespan, then it's the uh, System, uh, the product will be uh, uh, scrubbed. Those scrubbing uh, process is also being considered. Uh, so that's including from the cradle to grave. Okay, from here uh, we consider uh, all the materials uh, used for this uh, uh, building of this engine. Okay, 
uh, we only concern this uh, propulsion system in this process, not the structures uh, and still used for this shipbuilding. Okay. Uh, this including transport of the engine to the shipyard. Uh, during the transport period, uh, you also have this uh, uh, fuel consumed CO2 emitted. Uh, and in the shipyard, this uh, labor cost, uh, this uh, installation, uh, etc. Okay, operation stage is mainly this uh, fuel combustions and also this uh, uh, emissions. Uh, as I said, uh, from uh, that's not the first publication I have. I have uh, over twenty co-authored publications on this topic already. Okay, since the uh, uh, beginning of uh, two thousand. In detail, to apply this uh, uh, life cycle assessment method, we first uh, need to set up a goal and a scope. Okay, uh, this goal involves this target setup. Uh, from uh, this target, we need to uh, know this expected result. Okay, and then the scope will decide this. Uh, uh, it depend on this uh, uh, this uh, uh, data availability. Okay. Uh, Sometimes data is not available for certain period or for certain aspects of this uh, life cycle. You have to make some assumptions from engineering uh, uh, expertise or even from this uh, theoretical uh, uh, assessment, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, inventory setup is a key part of this uh, life cycle assessment. Okay, that's data collection. That's the the key part. Uh, as I said, uh, sometimes if data is not available, you have to make a reasonable assumptions there. Uh, data collected will have a different unit. You have to nominalize it, uh, nominalize it to a function unit. Uh, this uh, function unit could be depend on your uh, your goal. Okay, like uh, this uh, emissions uh, CO two equivalent emissions per tons of uh, cargo transmitted, or it could be in money. Monetary term, okay. In our assessment, uh, in the previous two projects, it was, uh, this uh, uh, function unit was depend on the application, and uh, in the latest project, uh, we just use this uh, uh, everything converted into monetary term. So then uh, it can be uh, uh, you know eligibly added together, or uh, you can tell the result straight away. Once the whole process finished, you can still refine the scope. Depend on this uh, uh, state uh, data available, and uh, your uh, you can feel that when you set up this uh, uh, event inventory, uh, which part is weak and which part is strong, then you can refine your scope. Mm -hmm. uh, then the last part is uh, uh, to run through this uh, model simulation, and then to uh, interpret your simulation result. Uh, we run a case study uh, for uh, not for this one. Okay, this uh, again. This is a life cycle uh, LCA and LCC uh, flow diagram. Uh, you can see this is the engine during the construction period for this engine installation. Okay, uh, that's the purchase of the systems. Uh, engines and also this uh, transportation of the engine, uh, emissions cost, uh, everything's involved. Then that's the ins installation period in the shipyard. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the operation phase. Uh, operation phase, we mainly consider the consumption of uh, uh, lubricating oil and also fuel oil. Uh, this also involves this uh, two type of oils, uh, transportation from the depot to this uh, uh, ship, you know, bunker system. And then emissions from uh, and the consumptions during this uh, ship's operation. Uh, the final bit is uh, this uh, uh, scrubbing phases uh, cost than the emission. So once you have these uh, three phases uh, uh, data nominalized, then you can do this uh, final LCA and LCCA. So this is the modeling process. Modeling process. Uh, then we run the several cases uh, studies. Okay. The first case study is uh, applied to a hybrid system, a hybrid uh, ferries. Okay, that's the ferry of 
built by this Fergus shipyard uh, in Sco Glasgow, operating in this uh, West Scotland now. Uh, there are three sister ships like this. Uh, the ship's uh, specific main principle, you know, dimensions like this. Uh, it has a power, in terms of power system, it has uh, three gensets, uh, each of uh, 360 kilowatts. It also have a uh, two bank of uh, battery systems, each produce uh, 250 uh, kilowatts power. Okay. Uh, in comparison, uh, they have a conventional, you know, this uh, diesel electrical system, uh, which only have uh, three gensets, and also their conventional system, which is a diesel mechanical system, that's a directly driven <coughs> system, which only has two engines, each of uh, 200, 450 kilowatts. Uh, the ship's uh, operating profile is like that, okay? For each day, it sails for six hours, uh, 0.6 hours for monoving, and the import is 3.72 hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the power consumptions for this uh, 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 at a different stage of uh, operation. Uh, the operation pattern of these uh, two types of you know, power system is, uh, is either 100% battery or 100% of diesel or 50%, 50-50. Okay. Uh, normally, during this monoma period, it, it uses battery you know, before this uh, vessels uh, approaching and uh, departing this uh, uh, terminal is use battery uh, at this uh, uh, so-called open sea or steady state state it uses uh, uh, diesel engines generates electricity and then drives this uh, uh, this electrical motors uh, in this case engine will be operating most time it has at its uh, 100 designed load and then at the low load is a battery in operation <coughs> That's this uh, system layout of this sy two three system for comparison. That's a hybrid system, three gen set, uh, and then there's a two bank of battery. Uh, oh, this uh, system do not have uh, this uh, charging function for for from this uh, generator to the battery directly. Those batteries are charged uh, uh, when this uh, uh, shapes uh, along the side. Uh, main charge is overnight. Okay. Uh, that's this uh, three gen set produce electricity. Then through this uh, uh, converting system, drives these motors. Uh, that's third option C is uh, this uh, diesel mechanical switch systems. <coughs> uh, this uh, very short summary. This uh, uh, advantage or disadvantage of this uh, hybrid propulsion systems. Uh, the advantage is uh, low fuel consumptions. That's obviously it's uh, only operating engines mainly operating at its uh, uh, f designed the full load condition where efficiency is high, uh, and the emission is low uh, because they, they at the low load is uh, uh, our battery in charge of this uh, uh, operation where there's no emissions. Uh, because the engine is always, you know, being operated, maintained as a design condition, so this maintenance interval is increased. Disadvantage, so electricity charge battery, electricity cost is higher, okay, you can see, it's uh, uh, depend on this time of charging, it could be three times expensive, this uh, uh, marine diesel oil. Uh, and also, Although emissions reduced uh, during this ship's operation, it could be more emissions, you know, being emitted uh, during this upstream where the electricity was generated. Okay. And the third point is uh, this uh, capital cost of the hybrid system is uh, much higher compared with the uh, conventional propulsion system. Um, that's the result of uh, analysis. Okay. On the left, that's the emission levels for these uh, three uh, options. Uh, this black color is a hybrid system, red color is uh, this uh, diesel electrical system, and uh, blue color is a diesel mechanical system. Uh, uh, you can see these uh, four columns, uh, this uh, different category of uh, emissions. Uh, global warming, uh, which is the CO2 equivalent, uh, this uh, uh, 
uh, uh, acid potential pollutions, that's uh, SO2 equivalent. Uh, those two, uh, I have a, I know that's a Chinese meaning, but the uh, English terms, uh, this uh, EP stands for eutrophication, okay? Uh, marine science people will know what they mean by that, okay? And this uh, uh, POCP stands for this, uh, photochemical ozone creation potential. Okay. <coughs> now you can see this uh, hybrid system's uh, emission level uh, in all the category is uh, better than other two. Uh, the right hand side diagram is the cost. Okay. Uh, again, this, uh, this triangle blue color is uh, conventional mechanical uh, uh, driving systems. Uh, this uh, black color uh, with the squares, that's uh, uh, this uh, hybrid system. And then this red color line is a diesel electrical uh, generating system. Uh, last year, we assumed that this uh, lifespan of this uh, shape uh, is 30 years. Now you can see at the initial, uh, at initially this uh, uh, cost of this uh, hybrid system is higher than this uh, conventional propulsion system and also higher than this uh, diesel electrical system. However, this uh, operation cost of this uh, direct driven system uh, is higher. As the years goes, it's increased uh, very quickly. Uh, at uh, year eight, so it's here, this uh, arrow changes should be pointed here. At year eight, this uh, uh, cost of this uh, uh, diesel electric, uh, diesel mechanical system, direct driven system, meet this uh, uh, hybrid system, which means the year payback period is eight years. Okay. Uh, compared with this, uh, one interesting part is uh, comparing this uh, hybrid system with this uh, diesel electrical system. You can see almost, uh, it's only at the year of 26, after somewhere 26, where this uh, operation cost of this uh, uh, hybrid system is uh, equal or lower than this uh, diesel electric system. Okay. Before this 26 years, uh, it's a hybrid system of cost is high. O that's the accumulative cost, I should say. Okay. Uh, how to see that, which means uh, this uh, diesel electric system cost-wise is better than this hybrid system. So if you consider the whole lifespan after 20 years, 26, cost is equal or even lower. But on top of that, you have to consider this uh, environmental impact. That's where this life cycle assessment uh, uh, lines, okay? Uh, if you purely consider cost, this uh, diesel electrical system might be better uh, for most period of the time of this uh, ship's operation. However, when you come back to this uh, emissions, uh, environmental impact, uh, this uh, hybrid system has the advantages. It this diagram considers uh, uh, three elements, uh, environmental cost, that's the uh, cost, the environment, and the risk, okay? Uh, Again, for these uh, three different options, uh, this uh, uh, hybrid uh, propulsion system has the lowest uh, in all these uh, category. Uh, that's this uh, hybrid system. Uh, we also apply these uh, uh, models, uh, these life cycle uh, assessment models developed to this uh, uh, solar panel uh, uh, propulsion systems where this is a, a conventional diesel electrical propulsion system ferry in Turkey, Istanbul, uh, where the owner is interested to install some solar panel system. And then we, uh, we got the, all this, uh, you know, this real data of these ve vessels and this operation profile. Uh, due to this uh, restriction of area available for the installation of solar panels, uh, it's only somewhere 400 meters available, square meter available. So the with such area available, this power generated from the solar panel is uh, 
72.1 kilowatts in theory, which is uh, some only less than 7% of this uh, total power produced by these uh, two diesel engines. Okay. Even this uh, seven, less than 7% of the power uh, from the solar panel, you can still see this uh, environmental impact uh, uh, benefit when using the system. Okay. Uh, again, we ran through this system, uh, all this data collection process for these engines, for solar panel materials, etc. Uh, that's the result for this uh, uh, two options, okay. Uh, we solved the solar panel, uh, it's red color, and with solar panels, uh, it's blue color. You can see the total all cost for these uh, 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 two options. It is uh, with solar panel, is uh, uh, lower than this uh, without the solar panel. And also the payback time is uh, three years. Okay. Uh, it seems uh, uh, there are two other case studies uh, uh, I could skip this one, and uh, also I can leave this uh, 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 presentations to this uh, organizer here. We can discuss it later. Okay, so I'll stop here. Okay, uh, sorry to run over a little bit over the time. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Professor Zhu, and I remind you that any questions you wish to push forward, uh, please use Slido uh, and ask away. And if you haven't done uh, the uh, poll, uh, or you've changed your mind even about things, then please uh, get on your mobile device and uh, press buttons. Um, now we're coming on to uh, our final speaker before the break. Uh, and uh, this talk is directed towards hybrid uh, propulsion solutions. And I, I drive a, a plug-in hybrid car, and I'm a great advocate of uh, this philosophy, hybridization. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how this technology will be applied to marine uh, craft. So it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce you to Erling uh, Johannesson. Uh, however, I because of changing of names of companies is the is in vogue at the moment, I understand. Uh, I think I will get uh, a link to make a, a brief comment, perhaps, on the, the roles, uh, Collingsburg uh, uh, transition, and even what your new job title is, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, who, who knows? Um, <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, kind invitation, Richard, and, and it's good to be here. Uh, uh, my name, at least, is uh, Erling Johansson, uh, still, and uh, as you s perhaps have seen in the um, interim um, program, uh, I was uh, previously uh, affiliated with uh, Rolls-Royce Marine, which was uh, acquired by um, Kongsberg uh, earlier this year, actually 1st of April, the closing of the deal was done. So. I I would like to spend a little bit of time on, uh, on my new company, and. Um, you can say our new strength uh, that we uh, believe that we have. Um, yeah, let me see. Um, I will come on to the outline of the talk later on, but uh, okay. So uh, what we have from actually from April the 1st is um, what we say is two great companies now performing together um, and uh, it's um, uniting the the uh, strengths of uh, both Rolls-Royce Marine and, you can say, the Kongsberg Group overall. Um, we call it the perfect fit. Um, uh, Rolls-Royce Marine has, of course, been uh, very strong on, in particular, on mechanical products, propulsion. We also have uh, uh, a good product range in, in electrical and automation system, but that is also an area where where our new colleagues in Kongsberg are also strong. So, um, uh, but um, in particular, uh, electrification is of course an area where we see uh, growth, and um, and we think that is also a perfect fit because then we are able to take larger contracts with our unified uh, strength, you can say. 
Um, yeah, a little bit about Kongsberg. Uh, this is, of course, new to me as well. <laughs> but uh, being a Norwegian, I, of course, have uh, followed this company for a while, and uh, I know a little bit about it. Uh, we have our ancestry back to, uh, to uh, when uh, Norway was a new, young uh, nation. In 1814, uh, the first uh, company was started in Kongsberg, uh, which is sort of connected to what we do today. And you can see that um, it's um, a lot uh, related to uh, defense uh, initially. But uh, in essence, uh, Kongsberg today is a technology group uh, and using that technology in different areas. Uh, from, uh, you can say, the deep oceans to outer space. Uh, our vision is to be world class through people, technology and dedication, of course, it's, it's important that um, we bring the people element into this. I, it's really the brains that uh, brings uh, good products uh, to market. Um, and these are the values of, you can say, call it the former Kongsberg group, uh, and that was uh, coined uh, before we joined as, uh, as uh, Rosaurus Marine. But our values are determined, collaborative, innovative, and reliable, and it's actually quite uh, good to to feel that um, uh, it uh, it sounds good also for uh, for us coming into this company. Uh, it makes sense to us, so uh, that uh, that is good for bring um, for creating a common culture as well with what we bring into the company. Um, yeah, our solutions. Uh, uh, it's all about. Um, extreme performance in extreme conditions. It's, uh, it's uh, very much about maritime. About 80% of our, uh, our uh, activities are, are, within, uh, are within maritime in the new company. And the business areas um, in the middle, perhaps centrally located, is Kongsberg Maritime, where we will be uh, uh, merged in as, as uh, Rolls-Royce Marine. Uh, and that will be the dominating uh, business area within uh, the Kongsberg Group going, uh, going forward. Uh, and then to the left you have uh, Kongsberg Digital, which is about creating uh, new uh, innovative digital solutions, also into the maritime industry, but uh, also outside of it. And then to the right, uh, a, large, uh, a large sector also on uh, defense and aerospace. Um, and uh, due to this, this uh, activities. We also have, uh, of course, uh, the Norwegian government as, uh, as a strong 50% uh, shareholder in Kongsberg. Um, yeah, so what is uh, happening? Uh, of course, I think we, we all recognize that the maritime industry is changing. This is uh, a picture of, uh, of the vessel Yara Birkeland, which is now being, uh, yeah, you can say, engineered and uh, it's uh, up for manufacturing in a, in a yard in, in Norway. Um, it's an uh, autonomous, uh, it's, oh, it will be an autonomous vessel uh, carrying uh, cargo for the Yara uh, fertilizer company uh, from the factory uh, down to the uh, shipping uh, port in the uh, eastern part of Norway. And, um, that is, of course, a bold step to take, you can say. But uh, we need these uh, sort of uh, bold decisions. It was uh, sold uh, perhaps on a napkin, um, uh, but uh, then we just have to deliver. <coughs> and that is what we uh, aim to do. Th this is uh, autonomous. It wi uh, there will be some manning uh, initially, uh, most likely. Um, at least remo uh, remotely controlled. Um, uh, it's full electric. So it's, uh, it's all batteries. It will be charged uh, from shore uh, and no uh, power generation on board. Um, so it, it, it's, really, uh, it's really an interesting project that will uh, sort of uh, bring the company forward, definitely. And uh, this uh, came, you can say, from the old Kongsberg Maritime uh, uh, Company. And, uh, and we in Rolls-Royce Marine has also had a, a good uh, legacy, you can say, on ship intelligence that will now be merged together, and, and together we will be much stronger in this area as well. Uh, yeah, global reach, we are a global company. I think that is fair to say. And we are across the globe, both uh, with factories and also with uh, customer uh, um, locations and service locations. 
This is the new Kongsberg Maritime uh, Company. We have uh, 7,600 employees, so that's uh, effectively doubling the size of the former Kongsberg Maritime. And, uh, and Rolls Royce uh, Marine was around, uh, yeah, so half, half of that. We are uh, having equipment on over 30,000 vessels. I think um, it said that there are sailing around 100,000 vessels globally. So we are on many, many of them. I, it can be varying from, uh, from full, uh, full uh, scope, full picture, you can say, but it can also be down to just the steering gear or, or, uh, or uh, uh, propeller. Uh, it, it varies a lot. Um, yeah, what we, uh, what we uh, claim is that we have the broadest portfolio of products in the marine uh, market today. These are the product uh, divisions, so propulsion and engines. Uh, we will continue to be a uh, route to market for um, uh, Rolls-Royce uh, uh, medium speed engines in Kongsberg Maritime. We have our strong uh, propulsion portfolio, of course, bringing into, into this new group. We are doing uh, integrated solutions, so that is sort of putting together, you can say, electrical uh, automation products and, and creating the total solutions, both on oil and gas, but also on maritime solutions. So, like this uh, Yara Birkeland, that is, uh, is a delivery from this integrated solutions uh, division. We are strong on sensors on robotics, autonomous um, uh, survey uh, vehicles like the Hugin, of course, uh, uh, very strong on, on sensors as well, simple, simple sensors. We um, have uh, our deck machinery business, which is uh, being continued as a separate product division within the new company, and we have uh, ship design, which is lifted out as a, as a new separate uh, division as well. So um, this will be uh, an interesting journey going forward. And we uh, say that we have the equipment from the bridge to the, uh, down to the propeller. Or, uh, or as we, in many cases, have been talking about, we have everything from from fuel to thrust, and also, of course, the design of the vessel as well. Yeah, um, I think uh, I think I leave uh, leave it with that for the company presentation. Uh, we uh, we have an interesting uh, future. Uh, of course, it's uh, a matter of uh, merging two cultures and different uh, colleagues coming together, etc. But that is uh, it's an uh, it's an interesting journey going forward. Um, and we. Um, have a slogan then of uh, providing the full picture. That was actually a, a slogan that Kongsberg Maritime used also in the past, but now it's even more true than before. So, uh, yeah. Um, on a personal note, it is of course interesting to join a company which is particularly strong on control systems, uh, dynamic positioning, what have you, that uh, Kongsberg have been uh, sort of uh, bringing to the market for 40 Yes, plus, and, uh, and uh, with uh, that as my own uh, personal background, that is, of course, interesting to join that company. Yeah, then we are uh, down to uh, the topic of today. D are you keeping time, uh, Norbert? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. I will try to uh, keep within time, otherwise we'll just uh, end. We have been talking about hybrid propulsion, so um, let's uh, see if we agree on the definition. I will, uh, I will <laughs> try to define it and I'll talk a little bit around that. What uh, the you can say the development of of the definition of hybrid uh, propulsion systems. I will talk a little bit about um, yeah, what I at least believe to be the major important building blocks in a, in a, a, a hybrid system: power electronics and energy storage. And then um, I will uh, dive as much as I can into a selected application. We have delivered a very interesting. Uh, uh, we have an we have a very interesting story, you can say, with the Norwegian Coastal Administration, where we have delivered a series of vessels now, and um, and done uh, a lot of innovation over the last years. Uh, and uh, innovation has happened rapidly, you can say. And I will talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, definition. Um, traditional propulsion solutions have, of course, been based on, uh, as, uh, as uh, Professor Shu was talking about, uh, um, on uh, a main engine coupled to a propeller. There has been some variations around it, of course, depending on the engine type, etc. Um, it could be a fixed pitch, it could be a controllable pitch. 
uh, and, and a gearbox uh, or not. Um, of course, the deep sea ocean going vessels, they have of course been with a, 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 a two stroke main engine and, uh, and a fixed pitch uh, propeller. Um, then um, you can say, uh, you call it the first generation of hybrid. Uh, it's perhaps better to call it hybrid transmission because we are now trying to perhaps use the word hybrid in a, in a different, uh, in different uh, setting. Uh, that is um, uh, to have um, power taken or uh, and or power take out on the on the gearbox. So um, you can say linking the main propulsion uh, uh, with uh, the switchboard and the and the power station uh, on the on the vessel. So that is what you can call a, a, a first generation hybrid. But uh, the what I will will be talking about here is uh, you can say uh, hybrid propulsion in the sense that the propulsion solution contains uh, um, some energy storage um, elements in, in the power system. And um, as you, I think you understand that uh, traditional power stations, power systems on, on a vessel has been an island where you need to balance the power consumption and the, uh, uh, and the power producers. It has to be a balance. Without uh, this balance, there is uh, immediate uh, blackout. Um, and uh, of course, you have a means of doing that in a controllable uh, manner. Uh, you, can, uh, you can do that. But of course, uh, bringing in, you can say, this flexibility of energy storage uh, essentially decouples these uh, two uh, producers and the consumers. And that uh, brings a lot of flexibility. And, the, and you infinite degrees of freedom, really, in the system. Uh, and uh, that is what I will be uh, talking about uh, later on. So that is, you can say, one of the, uh, one of the uh, examples uh, that um, Professor Xu was uh, mentioning in his, uh, in his talk. Typical usage of uh, energy storage in uh, these uh, hybrid propulsion systems is uh, to enable uh, zero emission. That can then be sailing with a vessel without any power generation at all. It can be sh uh, uh, charging from shore. It can be then uh, zero emission in the sense that you uh, charge your batteries or whatever it is, and then uh, stop your, your power generation. Um, it can be peak shaving, where you actually uh, flex uh, with your uh, energy storage and, and uh, avoid starting uh, the next uh, generating set. Um, or it can be what is uh, very much used in, in, uh, in these offshore applications, it's spinning reserve, where you avoid, uh, avoid starting uh, too many generating sets. You, you have uh, batteries as, uh, as your uh, reserve, and you can, you can stop. Uh, in, instead of having uh, four generating sets running, you can have uh, perhaps only, only one. Um, so that is my definition and what I will be using um, building blocks um, yeah quickly running through this but and this I'm, I'm trying to dig out the essence here um, power electronics is uh, you can say an enabling building block for hybrid uh, power systems it may be obvious but uh, I think it's important to, to, to mention it without uh, power electronics uh, you couldn't uh, enable this uh, or, or uh, build these uh, systems together in any way. Frequency conversion is uh, the uh, uh, traditional way of, of, uh, of thinking on uh, power electronics. Um, the, the full bridge uh, frequency converter where you, uh, where you have fixed AC on the switchboard and then you have variable AC on, a, let's say, in, on a motor drive or, or on a thruster drive. But uh, you can say the, ba uh, the basic building blocks are then uh, AC to DC conversion, and then DC to AC, like you see on the on the figure. Let me try to, uh, yeah, you can see it here. So this is sort of the full bridge um, setup. Um, another uh, uh, functionality with power electronics is um, uh, voltage uh, level matching. Um, for example, DC to DC, where you have a, you can have a battery or whatever. It can be a, it can be a capacitor bank um, with the varying uh, 
varying uh, uh, voltage level, and then you have to match it to a, to a DC bus, for instance, where you uh, distribute your power. That's another uh, use of it. State-of-the-art technology in uh, power electronics today is uh, to, to use um, uh, transistor technology, uh, RGBTs, uh, so that is, that is uh, insulated gate bipolar transistors. Um, these devices can be paralleled Typical uh, um, up to the megawatt range uh, without any trouble. Um, uh, typical voltage level is up to 1000 volts. So uh, it then fit to, you can say, uh, 690 volt AC systems. Um, and um, what you have to do is to uh, actually control this delicately at high frequencies. Uh, and then you can do that, th that control down to a microsecond level. Um, and that um, enables then, uh, 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 yeah, we call it um, delicate power flow control. You can you can switch off your uh, and, and adjust your uh, your uh, power levels and power directions uh, instantly, at least uh, uh, with uh, uh, relevant to the time scale we are talking about on the vessel. Uh, so that is a major building block. Uh, so we have uh, we have then our you could call it the Lego bricks, uh, these uh, full bridges that you can then parallel uh, up to uh, multi megawatt levels. You can uh, use them uh, uh, in the setup that you can see here on the on the uh, right hand of the screen, uh, where you combine you can say. Uh, uh, units where you have this full bridge implementation and then add in you can say power from from shore on a DC link and then distribute that on the power system um, using these standard building blocks. Another building block is this uh, uh, DC to AC converter where you you have a distribution on a DC level and uh, and create the fixed AC uh, on a on a hotel uh, uh, network, for instance, on a bus. How am I doing? Yeah, okay. Uh, I have to speed up. Uh, I can see that. Um, energy storage. Um, that is another major building block in hybrid systems. Um, important characteristics of, uh, of energy storage is uh, dynamic performance, charge and discharge uh, rates that, that you can obtain with these, uh, with these uh, units. Capacity size, volume, footprint, whatever, size, cost, and then of course also safety, important uh, characteristics. Um, possible uh, technologies to use, supercapacitors is one, um, and batteries is another. Uh, supercapacitors are extremely good at, uh, at uh, high discharge and, and charge rates, of course. Um, batteries, it's lithium ion technology that is used uh, uh, today in, in most marine applications with various chemistries, you can call it, on the cathode material. Um, you can create high power and you or you can create high energy types of batteries and with different characteristics. Uh, and this is different ways of arranging those uh, units in, in power systems. Um, a very popular way that we have arranged batteries uh, in, in our systems is actually directly on the DC link. Uh, allowing the uh, voltage level to vary. An alternative would be to to uh, to uh, install a DC to DC converter between the battery and the and the DC link. But um, uh, there can be pros and cons and cost benefits to either one actually, depending on the size of an installation. Uh, yeah, what we have been doing in. Uh, yeah, former Rolls Royce Marine, uh, now bringing that into Kongsberg uh, from an energy storage uh, experience perspective, is uh, what you see on the screen now. We have uh, delivered quite a few vessels actually. Some are in contract, some are actually sailing now. I will talk about uh, one of the multipurpose vessels uh, uh, later on. Uh, also, have an installation on uh, one sailing vessel actually, that's uh, Stolso Lamkul where we are actually harvesting energy from the propeller when it's sailing. That's an interesting application. Um, yeah, 
Credit to my colleague Christian Holmfjord for the uh, remaining slides. Uh, this is related to this um, multipurpose vessel uh, program that we have been uh, having with the Norwegian Coastal Administration. Um, the replacement plan, um, a little bit about that first. Um, ah, initially, if one slide on the Norwegian Coastal Administration. They are, of course, uh, uh, a, a Norwegian governmental organization uh, responsible for lighthouses, uh, navigation aids, uh, oil spill uh, uh, prevention, etc., and also pilot service in Norway. And they have a fleet, have had a, fl uh, a fleet of uh, vessels uh, over the last uh, few decades that have grown quite old, as you can see. Um, they are used uh, to, uh, to inspect these wheelhouse, this, uh, these lighthouses and, and uh, the navigation aids installed along the coast. And uh, then, uh, of course, they have uh, quite varied uh, route of, uh, of operation. It's uh, out on the coast. It's inside all the fjords. This is uh, where they operate, for instance, in, in the northern part of Norway. Um, this uh, is the power system setup that we uh, um, devised for the first uh, uh, replacement vessel that was delivered in 2011, I think. Uh, as you can see, um, a four, a four genset uh, power station, very typical diesel electric setup, uh, state of the art at the time, a shaft line propulsion from uh, large uh, main uh, uh, electric motors actually, multi-drive installation, driving both the main propulsion and also a tunnel thruster. Um, that was um, really innovative at the time and, and fit for purpose, definitely. Um, and then um, this is vessel number three, where we have a similar setup. But as you can notice on the, on the, on the, um, on the um, power system, we have uh, replaced one genset with uh, a battery, actually. Um, it's uh, a battery uh, and fronted by a, a frequency converter, so you can call it a, a virtual genset. It's producing AC onto the switchboard. Um, uh, all the modifications, replacing the shaft line propulsion with uh, azimuthing prop uh, propellers. Yet another innovation uh, that uh, was delivered um, yeah, uh, 2016. And then we are continuously doing uh, technology development. And uh, uh, I think uh, the Norwegian Coastal Administration has actually grasped the message that we received uh, this, uh, this morning, that um, uh, everyone has to do what they can do in order to reduce emissions in their operation, you can say. And they are uh, to be a, a governmental uh, a pub public uh, organization. They are really leaned forward, I would have to say. And uh, they have. Uh, have uh, decided to take on board on this uh, on this fleet replacement whatever new technology comes along. Uh, they have really done that. Um, uh, on this fourth vessel, they have uh, or we have delivered uh, a set of um, permanent magnet uh, azimuthing thrusters. So that is bringing the electric motor down into the thruster, you can say, with azimuthing capability as well. Uh, there are some. Uh, Efficiency benefits, simplicity, compactness, and, and also comfort uh, due to this. And of course, it uh, minimizes the inboard uh, installation as well. Um, that is, uh, is a novelty. We have uh, taken out the high speed diesels, replaced them with a good medium speed engine, uh, uh, and actually also installed uh, generators in both ends of the uh, of the uh, of the main engine. So that is a novelty. Um, and you can say the main benefit here uh, comes along when you also bring in this uh, what we call a save cube, which is uh, actually a DC distribution system that allows uh, variable speed on this main engine. So we can uh, we can run the uh, the uh, dual generator uh, ge generating set uh, with as a as a, prop a propulsion engine more or less uh, with variable speed, uh, and then distribute it uh, on this um, on this uh, on this um, DC switchboard. A little bit on the Rivingen, which is the name of this uh, last vessel. 
what we always do. We have a system perspective to this. We, of course, we have products, but the, the main focus is uh, to provide the very best system. We uh, go in and analyze the operational profile of the vessel. This is uh, sort of the high level uh, operational profile. It's doing DP, doing this uh, working uh, sessions. Uh, one minute. <laughs> uh, doing a little bit of transit, going through these from these uh, these ports and out to the to the, uh, to the workstation, and a lot of harbor. Then we uh, did uh, more detailed analysis using this uh, sister vessel, the vessel number three, analyzed down into the more detail. You can say the DP operation. What is the required uh, load levels? Trying to fit the best possible uh, components into the system. And uh, this is what we ended up with. This is the, you can say, the, the system setup. Uh, I think uh, it's better without this pointer. Um, so we have a, a common uh, DC distribution setup. It, the, the solution principle here is actually to install the batteries directly on the DC link and then have a generating set which is connected uh, via uh, a converter onto the DC link and then have a converter onto the electric motor. Yeah, uh, I think um, main topic, you're reducing from 42 down to six cylinders, and that is a huge benefit, mainly due to uh, maintenance cost. And of course, also better efficiency on, on a medium speed engine compared to a high speed engine. Um, yeah, I think uh, I leave it uh, there. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Erling, and I want to uh, wish you the best of luck in your new position, in your new job, and uh, hope the future is uh, all that you uh, wish for in this. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, uh, we will be uh, having a break very uh, shortly, but I wanted to just uh, take a uh, Slido question or so uh, to aim at the speakers, so I'm just handing over to Hans Christian here. Thank you very much, and thank you all for sending in your questions to Slido. We will start with one question to Dr. Johannesson. Uh, do you expect more mergers between Norwegian maritime companies in order to be able to compete with the international companies in new technologies? What, what can I say? Uh, yes, you can say from 20, uh, 2014 when the oil uh, crisis and the oil price dropped, uh, there has been a lot of, uh, of um, call it uh, consolidation, um, both on the customer side, definitely on the ship owner side, and uh, tremendous changes, to be honest. Um, and uh, and uh, what you can see now from this uh, merger between Rolls-Royce Marine and, and Kongsberg is uh, at least one uh, uh, one step. There could be more, but uh, um, yeah, are there any more obvious, uh, you can say, uh, players uh, out there that are uh, open for grabs? Um, hmm, good question. <laughs> And uh, another one, I think, for Palin. Yes, then we have a question to Palin Shu. Are there any reliable open source software for LCA or LCCA uh, applications for use in student projects? And how long does it need to learn the methods? <laughs> Thank you for this question, yeah. Uh, there, as far as I know, there are three commercial softwares uh, available now. Uh, quite expensive, probably not suitable for student project. Uh, once you know this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, theory and the methodology of uh, life cycle assessment, you can uh, produce this software yourself. Okay? Uh, from a previous project, uh, that the way, the good point to buy, to use this uh, commercial software is uh, they have a large data collections. Okay? Uh, and now we are developing our own data collections uh, for marine applications to try to set up this uh, for future you know, purpose. Yeah. Uh, the point is that there's no need to buy these uh, large commercial softwares. Just develop the software yourself. It's not that difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to go for a recess, a quick pause. Uh,
Uh, there is uh, tea, coffee, or coffee and tea because it's Norway, uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, some uh, uh, some carrot cake, I think, there, which went down very well last year as well. So uh, I recommend it to you. Uh, we've got about ten minutes. If we could get back in ten minutes, you're allowed to bring. Well, you're not really, but you can bring your some things back in. Yeah, and be eating and drinking.
Okay, welcome everyone back from the break. Apologies uh, that coffee, tea and cake were not as we expected it and you should have gotten it. So I hope the way to find it wasn't too far. Um, my name is Norbert Lümmen. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Mechanical and Marine Engineering here at HVL and I'm also a study coordinator for the bachelor studies in um, energy technology. Um, and uh, during the past year, I worked with some uh, colleagues from another department on um, new and um, uh, yeah, on new propulsion technologies for seagoing vessels. And uh, during the literature study, I came across a number of uh, interesting uh, papers, and one of them was titled "Renewable Methanol as a Fuel for the Shipping Industry." And here in Norway, we have heard a lot about uh, LNG. About 10 years ago, we had the first uh, national and international ferries uh, using LNG as a fuel. Then a few years later, there was a lot of bus around the Ampere, the first electrical car ferry crossing a fjord. And now everyone's uh, looking towards uh, Rogaland, where Norlet is working on the first um, ferry using liquid hydrogen as, uh, as a fuel. But some fuels that are obvious uh, to look at have been overlooked in the recent discussions. That's at least uh, the picture that I got in the past one or two years. And uh, one of them is methanol. And uh, so after reading this, uh, this article, I thought this would, should be something that uh, should be presented at the seminar. So I got into contact with the, uh, the authors of this article and I got a reply from Dr. Joanne Ellis from SSPA in Gothenburg in Sweden and uh, I welcome her very much to today's seminar and we are looking forward to your presentation about this uh, subject. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and my first time in Bergen to this beautiful city. So I was very happy to accept and come and also to have the opportunity to speak about renewable Methanol as a fuel for the shipping industry. Oh, I think I have. I've it's on? Yeah, okay. Maybe I just don't have it close enough. Is that the problem? Everything's fine? Okay, great. Yeah, so good to have the opportunity to speak about renewable methanol, which, um, as you mentioned, it doesn't, uh, hasn't gotten, or methanol in general hasn't maybe gotten so much attention um, uh, as a fuel. It's a uh, but a very interesting one. I come from SSPA Sweden. This is a company that used to be the state ship testing um, company in Sweden, by owned by the Swedish government, started in the 40s <coughs> to support the Swedish shipbuilding industry, which is sadly no more, really. <laughs> but uh, the company has been an independent company for many years and is owned by Chalmers Foundation, which also owns Chalmers University. So we're sort of nonprofit in the way that any uh, any profits go back into education and and our research department at SSPA, which I'm a part of, is also operating similar to a university research as a nonprofit. Um, so today I'd like to cover first uh, what is renewable methanol. I'm not sure uh, most people probably do know what methanol is, but I'll just cover that and and why is it a good fuel, good solution for sustainable marine transport, and then go over some of the marine methanol research projects and technical developments in this area you know, on the commercial side as well, and then cover some of the operational fuel supply and economic considerations to give sort of a total picture of the fuel from production and supply of the fuel to use on board and environmental considerations, and uh, finish with a summary. Oops, went the wrong way. Sorry about that. Right, so first generally what is methanol? It's the simplest alcohol, and it's also known as methyl alcohol, wood alcohol, or wood spirit. So long, long ago it was produced by destructive distillation of wood, so it was sort of <coughs> renewable from the beginning, although now it's largely produced from fossil feedstocks. And its chemical formula is C3OH, it's sometimes abbreviated uh, to MeOH, and it's a colorless flammable liquid at uh, ambient temperature, so similar in appearance to any alcohol, like, a drink, like vodka or something like that. So it's just clear liquid, um, easily handleable at uh, ambient temperatures. And it's extensively used in the chemical industry to produce thousands of everyday products from paints, adhesives, cosmetics, um, uh, even fleece and that sort of thing, plastic bottles. Um, 
and so it's widely transported and used for those purposes. But it has a growing use as a fuel, even though, you know, over the years, even in the 70s during the fuel crisis, there were large-scale trials with methanol as, a f as an automotive fuel in California. And now it's getting growing use in China, where the government has decided methanol is a very good solution for their car industry for two reasons, because of the low emissions characteristics, so it helps with the really severe air pollution, and also it can be domestically produced there. So they can produce it from coal, but also from other renewable sources that they are looking at. Um, there are many different feedstocks here. You can see I've shown gray for the fossil feedstocks. So natural gas is the main one that's used to produce methanol that's used in the chemical industry. And in Norway, it's produced from natural gas. But in China and uh, even India is looking into producing some from coal, and it can also be produced from oil. O on the renewable side, there's a whole range. I've tried to pick out the examples here of the ones that are been tested at pilot scale or commercial production. Um, so from the biomass or solid side, there is a municipal solid waste plant in Canada called Enerchem. So it's taking municipal waste that would be destined for a landfill and making it into methanol, and it's further upgraded to ethanol there. And this technology is being used to build a plant in Rotterdam now. Um, for the forest industry, re industry residuals, there's been uh, a lot of experience, but mostly on pilot scale with this in Sweden, testing pulp mill black liquor, where this uh, LTU green fuels, it's called, at PTO um, at the university there is now running this pilot plant, and it's got um, many thousands of hours of operating, taking the pulp mill, pulp mill black liquor and, and making either methanol or DME from that. And this specific methanol was tested in a small pilot boat project in Sweden called Green Pilot. And there is um, Sodra Forest Industries, forest products in Sweden is starting production at the end of this year or early 2020 of methanol that they have made at, um, from raw methanol that's a byproduct in one of their forest industry plants in Monsteros. And it's going to be only 5,000 tons of methanol a year, but they have the goal of being completely fossil free by 2030 in their operations. So they had the idea to use this methanol in a ship for taking their products down to mainland Europe. And they've already succeeded in largely being fossil free on their land operations using other methods. And then on the far right of the picture, you see methanol can be produced as electrofuel, they're called, or power to liquid, um, using carbon dioxide and renewable electricity. So a lot of other fuels can also be produced this way, but methanol is sort of the first one, the simplest, uh, requiring less energy to produce from, from power to liquid methods. And um, there's a, a project in Sweden taking steel mill off gases. It's a Horizon 2020 project called Free SME, and they will be producing methanol, I think, next year, just at a pilot scale, using the technology used in Iceland. And they're going to be using this methanol on the Stena Germanica ship, which has been long wanting to use some green methanol in their ships. Uh, what else? Um, Liquid Wind is a company in western Sweden that's been, they're, they're at the point now where they've designed a sort of modular type plants and they want to build one in western Sweden to take um, wind energy and CO2 from an industry in Stenningsund to produce so they haven't quite got everything in place, but they have the, the plan of producing one and then being able to produce more around Sweden where there would be renewable electricity and carbon dioxide. So the goal, the goal for the future really is to be able to capture CO2 from the air, which is a little bit more expensive now, and then to be able to make it into something like a liquid fuel. So we're recycling it. Um, but uh, uh, right now, it's, it's easier to take the low-hanging fruits, if you will, taking carbon dioxide that's already coming out of a flue gas flu uh, flu uh, stack and in flue gases and using that in a more concentrated form. But other areas where you could get CO2 from wastewater treatment plants, for example, the one in Sweden, that was a possibility in Gothenburg for making this methanol from liquid wind to take that CO2 or ethanol production also has a relatively clean uh, CO2 um, byproduct. So methanol could be co-produced there as well. So um, besides having a good environmental production footprint, what are the other factors to consider when evaluating alternative fuels solutions for shipping? There's ship owners that are going to be looking at first at the environmental side. Are they going to meet the current regulations right now? This for SOX and NOx, and actually it was this sulfur emission control 
area in the Baltic Sea of 0.1% sulfur that was the driving factor to start testing methanol in Sweden on the Stena Germanica because at the time it was a cost competitive solution and was projected to be lower than the 0.1% um, fuel oil. Uh, and so regulations like this really do work in, in getting solutions tested, and LNG was also being brought forward at that time. Um, and now we're looking into uh, many non-regulated, like carbon, uh, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases aren't regulated yet from shipping, but we see that on the horizon, and, um, and co corporations have their own goals, as I mentioned, with Sodra wanting to be fossil-free, and we're seeing the government fleets of ferries and vessels wanting to reduce... Um, their carbon footprint and becoming fossil free. So that's one factor. Then there's a technical and operational group of factors, you know, is the technology mature? Is there something we can use this fuel in? Um, how is it to store it on board? Is it relatively easy and to distribute it? And what are the risk and safety considerations? Because uh, shipping is regulated by international maritime organization regulations and the fuels have to pass, <laughs> pass those um, rigorous requirements for risk assessment for anything new that's a not, a, not a conventional fuel oil. Um, and then the fuel supply considerations for, for the infrastructure, for bunkering and storage on land. Is, is there anything there that can be used or does the whole costly new infrastructure and storage and distribution system need to be built for shipping? And what are the potential supply points and quantities that can be produced? And finally, of course, the economic factor is always important. What's the cost to retrofit or new build a, a ship to use this new fuel? And then what are the operational costs? Which this is largely dependent on what's the cost of the fuel itself. So for, for methanol, why is that a good solution for sustainable shipping? With emissions reductions, as I mentioned, with the sulfur, it doesn't contain any sulfur, so it meets this 0.1% uh, sulfur requirement. And now globally, mm, as of the 1st of January 2020, that's going to be 0.5% and all the rest of the world's oceans going down from 3.5% that it is now. Um, also, it's very low particulate matter emissions, extremely low because it's a clean burning alcohol, so it's uh, about 99% reduction as measured in one of the pilot projects I'm going to talk about later. Um, as well, the nitrous oxides are reduced without needing any after treatment. Some of the concepts can come down below the tier 3 for shipping, so that makes it a little bit, um, makes it attractive from that perspective. And uh, the fuel um, life cycle greenhouse gas emissions, when methanol is produced, renewably can, can achieve 90% or lower, depending on how the fuel is produced, what's the feedstock and what's the production methods. And another factor that's interesting but important as well for spills to the aquatic environment, it uh, dissolves completely in water and it's biodegradable and does not bioaccumulate. So now we're having sp spills of oil. Um, smaller spills around the Swedish coast, interestingly, like more than 100 a year will be recorded, not a big oil spill, but lots of little ones are happening operationally or, or illegal discharges, and if the fuel used on board was something like methanol or another fuel, it, it, would, be, uh, it would have positive impacts in that regard as well. And the, the greenhouse gas emission targets, as mentioned, with the IMO is now adopting this strategy has adopted a strategy to have 50% reduction by 2050. That seems a bit far <laughs> off, really. <laughs> I think they should move it up, maybe. And the, and the, European, uh, the European Commission had a white paper calling for 40% reduction by 2050. Um, and then we have the national examples I heard this morning that Norway has 50% by 2030 from our quiz, which I did not know. So I've seen that they have required in the transport plan that the fi all the new ferries have to be zero or low emissions, but that 50% by 2030 is very good. Um, Sweden has been looking at uh, how they can make their state-owned vessels be fossil-free. So looking at uh, there, all the road ferries are owned by the Swedish um, transport agency. So the road ferries, the pilot boats, uh, the icebreakers, they've seen methanol as a possibility for that. And so they did a study to see what are, the, what are the potential costs and can they achieve 2030 or possibly 2045, what's associated with meeting both of those. And I've seen in Norway as well about this um, requiring cruise ships and ferries in the World Heritage Zone, f uh, World Heritage f Fjords to be um, emissions free, which would be like a world first area where ships could emit nothing at all. So, so this is kind of the way 
it's going for fuels. And this is just an example. I haven't shown all the fuels, so if your favorite renewable <laughs> isn't there, then <laughs> please uh, forgive me for that. But I've just this was from a paper looking at methanol and ethanol. So the ones with the red bars are the fossil fuels. And if we're ever going to get 50% reduction, it's just not really possible with that. We have to go for you know, electricity as a fuel or a renewable fuel like methanol or um, liquefied biogas, something, something that is not coming from the ground. Fifteen, okay, oh, that's good. So these environmental benefits of methanol sort of, um, they've driven the development of different research projects. Here, I think I've shown most of the research projects or all that we could find when we were doing this report. Uh, uh, so there's not a whole lot that's tested with methanol. The first was uh, called Methapu, and methanol was tested in a fuel cell on a car carrier. This was a pilot installation, so it was just tested for a few months, but it showed that methanol could be safely handled and bunkered on board a ship. And then uh, this F-ship project came next in Sweden, and it was looking at um, how the shipping could reduce emissions overall, and Stenham was this, this in this project, and one of the work packages was looking at future fuels, and it was there that methanol came up as an idea. Well, nobody would used it before in a combustion engine, and would it work? It seemed feasible, so the next project that came from that was called Spirith, and it included testing um, methanol in a large Vartzilla engine. They were a partner, and bunkering methanol on this um, Stena scan rail. It's a, a row row, smaller row row vessel operating out of Gothenburg, and but using that in an engine being converted on board to DME, which uh, seemed to be rather complicated within the project, and the, then the, the other stream of testing methanol in the engine directly found that that worked really well. So then the next step was the Germanica conversion, which followed. And there have been a few other projects in other countries. Methaship is a German project that developed designs for a cruise ship and a ferry, although nothing was built, more um, looking at feasibility and design, and lean ships tested methanol in a um, Volvo Penta engine in a lab at the University of Ghent. Then these two other projects, Summit and Green Pilot, were both out of Sweden, looking at applications of methanol to smaller vessels like road ferries and a pilot boat. And the last one is a Horizon 2020 project called High Meth Ship. I've got a slide about that later. It's sort of a future thing about um, bunkering methanol and doing pre-combustion pre CO2 capture. So methanol went pretty quickly from being tested in these research projects to being full scale on large commercial vessels. The Stena Germanica being the first and the first uh, ferry to use methanol. It was converted in 2015. So all four main engines are du dual fuel methanol. This gives them the possibility to use the 0.1% regular fuel oil w uh, when it's cheaper, which it is right now, but they're still running all the time one methanol on it, or one engine <laughs> on methanol to get the operating experience. So in January when I talked to them, they said they had 7,000 hours of running experience on methanol. And for new build vessels, we have chemical tankers um, being operated by waterfront shipping, but with different owners, and we have two that are owned by Westfall Larsen, Norwegian company. And these uh, chemical tankers were built in 2016, and they are also dual fuel. So both the Germanica and these chemical tankers are using a pilot fuel ignition for the methanol, so about 5%, I think, in the case of the Chemical tankers is 7% fuel oil is used for ignition because methanol won't ignite itself in a compression engine, so you've got to look at some other ignition um, technology. And four new methanol tankers have now been ordered, will be delivered in 2019. I'm not really sure of, of the owners of those, but they've been performing well. And they have uh, one owned by the Swedish owner, Marinvest, reported passing 10,000 operating hours in, on methanol in 2019. These are chemical tankers that are carrying methanol as a, as a cargo, so they are able to operate, or they're bunkering it where they're picking up cargo as well. And after these projects, it was um, a lot of interest in Sweden to see, oh, how's it going to work on smaller vessels? Is it a flexible enough solution for that? So the Summit project looked at the design of a car ferry, 86 
meters length overall and looked at the feasibility there and also four different concepts of methanol in one using um, fuel additive and uh, in some sparking ignition concepts were tested in, in different laboratories as part of this project. So nothing was built for the car ferry but just a feasibility study of the design. And the Green Pilot project actually did convert a pilot boat to methanol operation but just as a test platform so it's not in regular operation. They converted one engine, there are two engines in the pilot boats. So the one was taken out and put in with a methanol engine. Have that on the next slide. So. Um, two different engines were tested on board in this project. One was Wei Chai, a, a Chinese engine. As I mentioned, they're doing a lot with methanol in China, so they already had a conversion um, kit and plans for this engine f to be converted to methanol, so that was used and it was tested on board, and as well a uh, Scania engine. And both used spark ignited port fuel technology, so there was no pilot fuel. This is kind of maybe a better solution for a smaller vessel. You don't want to have two types of fuel on board and if you're a pilot boat operator or something maybe you can just make the decision that you could run with methanol. As, as well if you're burning methanol you could also burn ethanol in an alcohol engine and in Sweden we're tr trying to get a project going to test both ethanol and methanol together in the same engine to, to see that they'll both work. They should, should operate about the same. And the project used a fossil free methanol and uh, the onboard emissions measurements were done to verify that the, um, the emissions were in fact low for this concept as well. Chalmers University carried out the particulate uh, testing on board and you can see that um, you know the methanol particulates 2.8 tons 10 to the minus 6 is practically nothing there without any need for um, after treatment and the NOx is very low there was no after treatment there and, and no sulfur was verified of course. Um, this high mass ship project is uh, yeah, quite a busy slide that came from the project. It's kind of an interesting concept where renewable methanol is bunkered on board. And methanol is used because it's so easy to transport and store. And um, prior to combustion in an engine, there is, um, um, it's, it's uh, converted or it's, there's pre-combustion capture of the CO2. So hydrogen goes into the engine, which is also going to be able to burn methanol. And the CO2 is stored on board. When the ship come back, comes back into port, somewhere where they may be producing renewable methanol, the CO2 can be used again. This is only going to be tested in demonstrator on land at the end of 2021. So it's a bit further off, but it's interesting in that it's sort of the whole package of using the same carbon over and over. Um, for operational considerations for the conventional methanol applications, from the safety perspective, I just wanted to, to go over some of these. It's, it's different from other from the conventional fuels in that it has uh, a lower flash point, less than 60 degrees. So the International Maritime Organization needs to develop new regulations, which it has been doing and which it has done for LNG. Um, and some of the special characteristics, well, it, uh, you know, um, it's got, it burns with a clear flame, so you have to be careful about this in engine rooms to note that uh, for firefighting, fire detection purposes, um, other things, it's got a fairly wide flammability range, 5, 6 to 36 percent. So you need to have detection and ventilation. Um, and it's corrosive, so material selection is important. Stainless steel is fine with methanol, but some of the, some of the engine um, seals and those sorts of things might have to be switched out with something that is uh, more compatible with methanol. And it's toxic to humans by ingestion, inhalation, or contact. So you have to wear gloves and um, have it confined as any fuel in a, in a system where you can detect any leaks. Um, and the regulations and guidelines, as I said, are under development. In last year, in 2018, they Draft technical provisions were approved, so they're still working their way through the IMO, but the ship classification societies have developed their own rules um, that are provisional until the final ones are approved by IMO. So Lloyd's Register had them in 2015 in DNVGL, which I think has classed the um, Norwegian chemical tankers had their rules in 2013, and both of the vessels carried out risk assessments to show um, safety that was uh, equivalent to conventional systems, which is what, what is required before the regulations come in. 
Right, and um, on the economic side, what's, what's the cost of methanol? And the ship life cycle costs, you want to, for, for replacing sort of the fuel systems, you would look more at the investment costs and the operational costs. And for, for methanol, for retrofit, uh, the main items would be modification of the engine and the onboard fuel systems um, and changing up some of the associated safety systems. A study, I've shown the reference there, that was done for the European Maritime Safety Agency compared methanol with some other comparable ways of reducing um, the SOX, LNG, and, uh, and also to um, scrubbers and found that methanol had lower installation costs than LNG, which makes sense because it's a liquid, it's rel relatively simple, and its storage is simple, and about the same for a scrubber. For operating costs, fuel costs really are the majority of ship operation costs, and unfortunately, renewable fuels are all more expensive than uh, fossil fuels right now, but uh, um, if you look at methanol produced from um, the fossil fuel sources, you can see there was a period where it was actually lower than the MGO price, so this is at the time when the methanol project started. And here I put on some um, prices, some cost of production for renewable methanol, and you see that it's really not that bad for different sources. The e-methanol is estimated to be around 80 to 140 euros per megawatt hours. These are all on an energy equivalent basis. Um, you can see this red dot at the bottom is producing methanol from um, municipal waste. This was a feasibility study done in Italy, and right now their municipal waste is taken away by ships, so if you're making methanol from it, you're getting paid to take the feedstock, so that's why the price was so low. So in some situations, it, it could be quite low to produce. And then um, I've shown hydrogen, hydrogenated vegetable oil, which is a drop in uh, biofuel, and um, methanol can can be within the range of that as well to produce. So it, it's competitive compared to other renewable fuels, I think. And the other thing that it could be considered is the methanol produced for the chemical industry is 99.85% pure. For the fuels, it doesn't have to be so. And a few of the projects tested methanol with 10% water in the engine and found it reduced NOx because it had a cooling effect. And um, I think MAN has said they could go as low as, you know, 70% methanol. But this needs to be something, this isn't something that the fossil fuel methanol would want to produce, but maybe some smaller biofuel producers, renewable fuel producers could set their eye on just a fuel market and be able to lower their cost by producing something that wasn't as pure. So there's sort of an opportunity there. In terms of supply and bunkering, um, yeah, methanol is regularly transported by, I see I'm running out of time, <laughs> road, rail, and sea, so um, there's lots of distribution in place for that. In fact, it's, uh, it's relatively simple from that perspective, and Stena had costed out what it would cost to convert um, a regular bunker vessel to methanol, and it was quite reasonable because those bunker ships are classed as chemical tankers. Um, and storage on board, methanol is not as energy dense as regular fuel oil. It's got half the density, so you have to store more or bunker more frequently. So with the Swedish ferries, for example, they bunker once a month. They thought, okay, if we went to methanol, it would be every two weeks. Not so bad. Although they, it's still a liquid fuel, so you're talking a lot higher density than energy density than batteries or something like hydrogen. Um, and there's a lot of flexibility about the tank location as it's not classified as toxic to marine organisms by the IMO procedures for carrying it, so it can be carried as a cargo next to the hull, and um, this is also the case for the fuel tanks below the water line, so there's a lot of flexibility of where you can put it on a ship. And uh, to summarize uh, what these factors, all of these factors I talked about for the technical and operational, um, methanol's demonstrated good performance, and its uh, technology is uh, quite mature for using it in the engines and for the cost and economic uh, for investments. It's um, quite reasonable, and really the price of the fuel depends on what you're comparing it to and what the other prices are uh, for fuel supply considerations. There's a lot of potential for producing renewable methanol, and already there's a lot of fossil methanol that could be blended if you're trying to lower your target gradually from the amount of renewable. And from the environmental considerations, the emissions are very good, and uh, you can really reduce the life cycle well to wake greenhouse gas emissions. Well, thanks very much.
Thank you very much, Jan, for this interesting talk. Uh, and you actually answered all the questions uh, that came up uh, that were directed to you during your talk. So we can directly go to the uh, to the next speaker. And uh, this is uh, Tor Andre Berg from uh, both BKK and from a company now called Pluck, earlier mm -hmm. called Bergen Landström, which is probably a better. Um, describes better what it is all about. The thing is that ships are not only at sea, they also spend a considerable time um, at case in harbors, uh, and even though the main engines are not running, they have a need for power, but there will also always be some sort of uh, genset running, usually on fossil fuels, and this creates local emissions that are unwanted, especially if this happens in a densely populated area, like Bergen Harbor, which is surrounded by a nice city, um, but it's not only in winter, but also on nice summer days that there is always a thin haze of uh, exhaust uh, in the air. And you can always, uh, in many situations, trace it back to one or two cruise ships or supply ships lying in the harbor. So there's been a discussion uh, around doing something about that for a long time in Bergen. And I'm looking forward to hear from you what uh, are the current plans to do something about that with electrifying Bergen Harbor. Thank you. Okay, first of all, um, plug, the name of the company, is actually the only English word we use. We, we use Norwegian, and I, when Richard asked me to do this in English, I was uh, not quite sure. Uh, so if I stop and stare out into the air in lack of the English word, and it takes some time, please blame Richard, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, and then thank you for having me and for having me or letting me talk about the most interesting part of uh, shipping or, s or uh, yeah. And that's the time when the ships are not sailing because at least that's the most interesting part for us because that's the part where we can do something and we like to do stuff. Uh, shore power, uh, that's more like the not batteries, just uh, providing power for the hotel load, as you call it, and also charging in the port of Bergen and somewhat more. I'll tell you about that. Yeah, this is Norway. This is Bergen. This is what the tourists come to see. And Bergen is Norway's number one cruise port. Uh, they told me that it's uh, the fourth largest cruise destination in Europe. Um, uh, and this is beautiful and uh, everything we like to tell or show about Norway. But this is also Bergen. And uh, Nor uh, Bergen, the port of Bergen, has an ambition to be the greenest port in Norway. And then they see, and they have seen for many years, that this can't be. Uh, to be fair, uh, very often when you see uh, emissions from a cruise ships, it's mostly water vapor, but it's also a significant contribution from the cruise ships and other ships in the harbor to uh, the pollution that we don't like. And we know, we know for many reasons that the, uh, the people of Bergen won't accept this. No way. Maybe uh, one or more, two more years, but it has to go. So we were working together with, uh, well, first of all, uh, it has been said earlier today uh, that Norway has a fantastic um, role to play uh, because we have this uh, great electric uh, system already in place. We have lots of hydropower uh, plants. We have uh, an all renewable um, power production already in place. 96% hydropower, now it's approximately 2% wind power a little bit of uh, uh, gas power, but it's, uh, it won't last f very long, I think. And also it's a very big and strong system. The Norwegian power consumpti consumption is already around 25% of the whole of uh, Germany. And that tells you something about what kind of system we have. And it's also it's very easy for us to, to roll out the electric vehicles because we have a strong system where the, every house has, is built to, have, uh, to, to be able to use lots of electricity. And it's sort of the same for, for the harbors. Um, 
So we worked together with uh, the port of Bergen and we thought that, okay, uh, there are lots of harbors uh, implementing shore power and everyone is doing it their way. And they're uh, figuring it out on them uh, for themselves every time. So we figured that if we can work together, combine the resources, combine the competences of the Port of Bergen and BKK, try to look at this more like uh, a business opportunity, try to build competences that could be used in other ports as well, then we might be able to contribute to a faster uh, implementation of this technology. So we started Bergen Landström, or PLUG, and our idea is to to take care of everything, and I, I mean everything, uh, on, the, on the shore side of the solution. And we know from all our dialogue with the ship owners that they want to concentrate on their ships. They, they don't want to figure out how to get their energy from, from shore. And if we can um, make sure that uh, the renewable energy from shore is cheap, it's simple, it's there, then we have uh, we can make uh, something they're interested in. So we're going to take care of everything shoreside. That's the idea. Um, and we're not the only ones who believe that shore power is part of the solution. The IMO says this. The uh, EU, in their um, alternative fuels directives, point to shore power as part of the solution. And also Norwegian authorities uh, point to shore power as an important part of the solution when we're going to make the shipping industry greener. It's not a whole solution. Uh, I've done quite a lot of calculations on how much, uh, how big a part can electricity and batteries play in this, uh, in the industry. And we need fuels. We need some kinds of renewable fuels to make, um, to make uh, well, solutions for all of this. Uh, but uh, shore power, electricity from renewable en energy produced onshore will very often be the cheapest solution if, you're gone, if you can store it and if you can provide it to the, to the vessel. Okay, uh, what we're doing in Bergen. Uh, this is, uh, for those who are not familiar, this is uh, the center of Bergen, this area. And Bergen is a shipping city. There are, at uh, any time, lots of ships anchored or at key in different parts of the city center. And we are building um, shore power um, facilities for Firstly, uh, low voltage uh, needs or ships that need low voltage solutions, supply ships, um, research vessels, Schistwerkets uh, uh, ships. And uh, we have installed low voltage solutions in this area at Skolten. We have done it for uh, the Coastal Express. Uh, we've installed at Dokken mainly for supply ships. We're finishing this on Nykirke Kajen, and in probably this summer, you'll see the shore power facilities at Festnings Kajen. That's on Bryggen. So we're trying to make this look very nice because we don't want to end up in trouble. But uh, in a few months, you'll see uh, the shore power facilities at, at uh, Festningskajen på Bryggen, and I hope you'll uh, like, like what you see. Uh, low voltage is uh, quite simple, quite. Nothing is as simple as we should, uh, as we would, you would um, mm -hmm. <laughs> as we would wish, <laughs> but uh, that's uh, the real Difficult thing is uh, is the high voltage solutions, very high volume, and that's cruise ships. For us, it's cruise ships. That's a big challenge. 
And why is that? Well, the low voltage. Uh, this is the this is the market in Bergen. Supply ships, uh, lots of them. Uh, they uh, they stay for many many hours, sometimes weeks. Uh, they're not too big, from um, well, 200 to 600 kilowatts. They use low voltage. There is a standard in place. The Coastal Express, great customer. 11 ships coming in, clockwork, once every day. We know them, we know the needs. They, they need 50 hertz, so we don't need converters. Uh, quite simple. And then we have the cruise ships. Uh, we need uh, room for three or four at a time. They, they don't stay that long. Most of them will stay six to eight, nine hours. They need 60 hertz and they need high voltage, 11 kilowatts, most of them, and up to 12,000 kilowatts. And that's a lot of power. Uh, and the, this, this, uh, the differences between supply uh, ships, Coastal Express, cruise ships, ferries, as I've taken here or shown here as an, uh, to compare, uh, they, they mean that we have to find different solutions for the different ships. And that's very important to understand. I see lots of, uh, of uh, referat, ref protocols from uh, local authorities that say that we want shore power in our port. Well, what? Huh? Hmm? Well, they, uh, and they have different kinds of ships, and they have uh, many ships smaller than these as well. And you can't say that we want shore power. You have to understand what kind of uh, market, what kind of uh, boats do you, uh, do you want to reduce emis the emissions from, and then try to find the best solutions. Ferries, totally different uh, pattern from, from the other part, from the other uh, yeah, ships. Okay, another uh, example. Uh, this is uh, the pattern. This is uh, the calls, the how many uh, ships are uh, arriving at the uh, Mongsta. It's a supply base outside of Bergen every day, all year. And th these are low voltage ships, 200, 400 kilowatts, 500 kilowatts perhaps. Uh, and they are very regular. And this is the cruise, cruise industry in Bergen. They come in, uh, in the summertime, need high voltage up to 16 megawatt hours or MVA per um, per ship, and the investment to do this would be the same as if they were here all year, but the market is 30% uh, or 25% of, of what we would see if you had this pattern. So the economics of scale is totally different, and this makes this a much more difficult investment. Okay, uh, the Coastal Express is quite interesting because it's um, sort of a um, half ferry and half cruise liner. Uh, there are going to be two uh, ship owners running uh, or taking part in this route uh, from two 2020. One, I think. Uh, one of those is going to have uh, more than six megawatt hours of batteries on board. The other one is, uh, I'm not quite sure, but up to 2,000 uh, mega uh, kilowatt hours. Six megawatt hours, two megawatt hours. Um, and they've decided on the solution for shore power what kind of uh, connection they were going to use before they planned on using batteries. So one of the difficult tasks now is to try to charge the batteries as much as possible within the limits of the connection system, the plug, which has a capacity of 2,200 
kilowatts, you might say. Uh, the hotel load will be around uh, 1,000 kilowatts. So in between here, we have some capacity to charge the ships. The other um, main uh, limit on charging these batteries is the length of stay. In Bergen, uh, they stay up to eight hours. And then we have the time to charge uh, the largest batteries, no problem. But in uh, other ports, of course, when they're staying five minutes, you can't even connect in five minutes. Even though uh, this special system is designed to connect very fast. So it's not been decided yet where and how will they charge the batteries, but it's a very exciting, to a very exciting case. It's going to happen. We have to find solutions, and. Uh, we have solutions in place in Bergen, and uh, we're trying to figure out how this should look on the rest of the coastal route. Am I? Uh, do you understand everything? Okay. Please ask questions uh, later, and I'll try to answer them. Okay. Uh, why? Is this uh, difficult, or and then um, well, the the big investment uh, when we're trying to supply the the cruise ships is converters. Uh, shore power for cruise ships is, is quite common in North America, but there they're using 60 hertz. The grid in America is 60 hertz. In Europe, in Norway, most of the world, it's 50 hertz, and to be able to supply the cruise ships, which use 60 hertz, we need uh, big converters. Uh, and that's the biggest investment and the biggest footprint of shore power. This is uh, actually, these are the two uh, installed shore power facilities for cruise in uh, Europe. Uh, or maybe there's one in uh, Kiel, I'm not quite sure if it's operational. Uh, this is in Hamburg, the first one built, a beautiful, building. It's a signal big, uh, very, very nice. Um, and it's only 12 MVA, 12,000 kilowatts. So it's not enough for the biggest cruise ships that uh, arrive at uh, Bergen. It's not even enough for the biggest cruise ships in, in Hamburg. And it's for one ship at a time. One. Uh, this is a solution they've uh, they've installed in Christian Sun. Uh, actually, these were meant for Copenhagen, Copenhagen, and then they uh, Copenhagen wouldn't have it anyway, and they made a deal with Christian Sun. And just in a few months, they changed direction and installed it in, in Christian Sun. This is uh, approximately the same capacity, somewhat more than this uh, in Hamburg, and, and totally different solution like in containers, six or eight, I, th I think, total. And in uh, Bergen, we're, we're going to install the shore power facilities at the uh, Skoltegrundskajen for the locals. It's, um, if you're at the um, Festningen i Bergen, uh, the, the fortress, uh, when, you, when you sail into Bergen, you see the fortress. When you stand at the fortress and look down on Skoltegrundskajen, you won't like to see this. This is not acceptable. So you have to find something that's very compact, much more compact than in Hamburg, because we're going to install the capacity for three ships at a time. And we're, we don't have much space. So um, actually, uh, these days, we're uh, discussing this with uh, possible suppliers. And uh, we are, uh, well, it's, like it's exciting times. <laughs> so we try to find, as I say, something that's compact, cheap, uh, and uh, works from day one. OK, uh, another picture. Another important part of the solution is the cable management system. And uh, for a big cruise ships, for this standard, for high voltage, st the high voltage standard, 
we need uh, normally four cables, each with one plug. Uh, each plug weighs 40 kilos, and there's a fifth one for communication. There's an international standard to make this uh, work. And um, for low voltage, you, you can almost do it by hand. Uh, these systems need some kind of support to make sure that uh, everything goes uh, smooth. In Hamburg, they have a very large difference between low tide and high tide. So they have a very uh, complex but still working system that makes this uh, the, the plugs, uh, that can align the plugs with the ship wherever, whatever height the ship has uh, compared to the key. And they also, the, the, dif the distance between the key and the ship is very big, so they have a very complex uh, system to, to be able to uh, bring the plugs aboard. In uh, San Diego, the system is much uh, simpler. You just hang it, and then someone inside just drags it, makes contact and drags it, and then there's a manual connection on the ship. And uh, what we're going to use in, in Bergen, uh, we'll have to see, but we'll try to make it as uh, simple as possible, because this is new technology. We see that uh, there are new solutions if not every day, so at least the, the technology moves forward quite fast. So maybe we're just going to build one complex system, keep two systems very simple, and then build uh, more complex systems or better systems when they uh, get there. Okay, Bergen is just the, four, uh, the first, as we say it. This is uh, a Shore power facility we've designed for Olesen, uh, not as many ships. We're designing this for two ships at a time. And uh, I'm not going to go into very much of this. Uh, it's much, in many ways, easier than in Bergen. Um, what's interesting in that is that we used almost a year to design the first plant in Bergen. When we had to design uh, 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 a facility in Ålesund, we used maybe two weeks. Because <laughs> we, we learned so much. And th that's the idea behind uh, the company as well. If we're going to learn how to do this, let's use it uh, more, more, uh, in more harbors. Um, Ålesund, Kristiansand, Bergen, uh, Oslo is interested, Stavanger is interested, Trondheim might be interested, but it's not enough, of course. Uh, if we're really going to reduce emissions from the cruise industry, we, um, we can't just think about Norway. Uh, I think in two, two or three weeks we're going to have uh, tried to gather some of the cruise destinations other cruise destinations, which is uh, interested in, uh, in shore power, uh, Dubrovnik, uh, I think uh, Kiel, Copenhagen, Hamburg. So there are different ports which are interested in, in doing sort of the same things. And it's also important for us because uh, if there's one or two or three harbors in all of Europe that can uh, provide shore power for cruise ships, why should the cruise ships uh, uh, redesign their, uh, their ships? Why should they um, do the investment that's needed to, to, to make use of the shore power? Uh, it's a much best better investment if there are lots of harbor doing this. Uh, what we can do in Norway, why Norway is important is that we're saying that, uh, okay, we know you all want to go to Bergen. Well, you know, you all want to go to the fjords, to, to, to Norway, to Svalbard as well. But you can't come unless you pollute less. Just can't. Uh, and then, uh, and that's a trigger. That's a real important trigger. And we see that uh, the, um, the mood, the, 
the way the cruise industry is thinking is totally different now from one year ago. Then they said, this is too expensive, we can't do this. But now they're saying, of course, shore power, Norway, we know it's coming. We're rebuilding every ship. Uh, some of the big cruise liners said that we're rebuilding every ship we have as soon as they have their next uh, stay at uh, the wharf. Wharf? Wharf. So shore power is part of their future, but as I said, uh, this is just, let's say, 10 to 15 percent of their um, of their fuel consumption that can be um, uh, well replaced by shore power. So it's, uh, it's we have to find solutions for uh, for the time at sea as well, and also, of course, this costs money, and. Uh, how much are they willing to pay? I believe if it's if it's the only way to be able to uh, visit Norway, then there's lots of money. But it's uh, it's going to cost more than uh, than uh, the MGO or the uh, LNG or any other solutions. Yeah. Thirty-two seconds. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you very much for this interesting talk and also keeping uh, the time. And I also think you handled the uh, language challenge very, very well. You almost deserve an extra applause for that. <laughs> okay, we come to the last point on today's program and this is a um, uh, discussion with all speakers. So I would like to invite all uh, to of today's speakers to the front and we will... Uh, Gather and go through the questions that uh, have come up on uh, Slido that you have asked there. We'll uh, have another poll, probably. And uh, the discussion is led by Dr. Christian gülbranson fröser She is the Energy Director at the uh, University of Bergen. And she's also a member of the Program Committee, which organizes these uh, half-day seminars of the Bergen Energy Lab. So, uh, please. Regarding the costs, and uh, that is for Dr. Alice. What is the cost of Magnus? Mute. Yes. Better? Yes. Okay. So, um, should all of you have the questions here? Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah because exactly. It's the question that's highlighted. What's, what is the cost of methanol compared to the other fuels? Okay, uh, mm. I showed that um, on the slide. If you're talking about fossil methanol compared to other fossil mm. fuels, it's a bit higher right now, but it's varied over time. In the period when the Germanica decided to convert, it was about 15% lower, and now it's about, uh, I would say, 10% higher. And if you're talking about renewable fuels, mm. I think it's in the same range as other renewable fuels. Shipping isn't using renewable fuels at all right now, except when you're talking about shore connection to batteries, but nobody's using a, a liquid fuel that's uh, renewable. There was one ship in um, Gothenburg that used liquefied biogas just as one uh, trial. So um, yeah, I think that uh, the prices, the costs have been compared in a study for the European biofuel industry, and methanol was pretty comparable or cheaper than some, so <laughs> it's hard to give an exact. Mm. Price. It is. So, another question regarding the fuels is uh, how, how does hydrogen fit into the picture? Because we have heard a lot about hydrogen earlier today as well. So, maybe again. Yes, hydrogen is just something that's coming on and it has only been used on very small vessels, and uh, there's one um, in Belgium. And the storage problem with hydrogen still isn't solved for large vessels. It's not even carried as a cargo. So to be able to use hydrogen on an ocean-going vessel just isn't, isn't happening right now. It's, I think it would be much further behind methanol. They haven't just started to discuss it at the IMO, although I know the class societies have started to develop rules for hydrogen. Um, but it's the storage issue and the cost with that, I think, 
is going to be very high and, and um, it will take some time to that. But for smaller demonstrations and in fuel cells and for short distances, sure, I think it's, oh, there's a, a vessel in Germany also using it, um, just a passenger shuttle for tourism has used hydrogen in a fuel cell. So it's, it's only these very niche, small applications, very short distances. Hmm. So uh, uh, do you think it's kind of too optimistic what we heard about that is all this talk about hydrogen that we heard earlier today? Well, yeah. I didn't catch quite all of that in the no, Norwegian, okay. mm -hmm. but I think hydrogen, I can see, you know, there's no carbon atom in the fuel. Mm. I think it's maybe a little bit um, optimistic to think it will come soon, mm. you know, and hydrogen and methanol, they are, uh, hydrogen's an energy carrier essentially, and so is methanol. And I think if you're looking at a cheaper, what can happen first, if you're looking for an energy carrier, I think methanol is, is, is a cheaper solution if you're looking at globally for storing it, for distributing it, it's already got a system there and it already works in um, combustion engines. So, But hydrogen, I <laughs> nothing against it, but I think it's going to take some more time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, please please direct your questions yeah, towards slide, uh, through Slido. Or is it a very quick no, following up? Related to this, since you suggest or somebody suggests hydrogen, because I a few days ago I heard about ammonia also yes. being, mm. being used here. And can you... Can uh, ammonia. Very quick question. Yeah, ammonia answer. is very new. And yeah, MAN has said they could burn it in their engines. They could develop that. But again, this is something, ammonia's got big safety concerns. So to be able to, to develop that as well, to be used on a ship, I think is is far away as well, but it also has the advantage of not having a carbon atom in it. Thank you. And then there is a question for Tor André uh, Berg about the international initiatives about the electrifications of ports. Yeah, the standards. Uh, yeah. Well, if you ask the, the hardcore standard people, they say there's only one. And that's the IEC. 80,001, 80, mm. and that's the high voltage uh, standard, which are used for cruise ships. Mm. That's the only one. In, in, pra in practice, there's also the low voltage uh, standard, 80,003, 80, which is used for so many ves vessels that it's going to be an official standard uh, quite soon, I think. Mm. Uh, we need, um, for, for, uh, for ferries, there is no standard, mm -hmm. and, and that's uh, intentional because we, we don't quite know which will be the best solution. So today, every ferry has its own solution for charging, and you can't exchange a ferry from one or a ch exchange a ferry mm -hmm. from one route to another um, like you can today with the with the diesel. Mm. And we need a. Actually, we also need a standard for uh, smaller ships than the 80,003, and there is work uh, for uh, work on the way for uh, for a Norwegian standard on this. So mm -hmm. standards are important, but they they seem to fall into place somehow. It's not a big solution. So you don't think uh, the lack of standard is, is what will hamper the electrification of the ports? It will hamper, but it's, uh, it's not the biggest challenge. Mm. Uh, we need standards, uh, but uh, that's not where what we're thinking about every day. We believe that uh, the standards that are in place are old and not very good. The the high voltage mm. standard is was designed for use in mines in the United States, <laughs> and then they <laughs> took it and used it on uh, in the ports, and it was said that uh, they wanted a standard which needed at least three port workers to handle. That's the criteria, and that's <laughs> that's not very good. <laughs> okay, thank you. And then we have uh, the question about hacking for you. Okay, yeah. yeah. What do you think about the uh, anonymi uh, autonomous uh, autonomic <laughs> ships and uh, the dangerous when it comes to Yeah, hacking? you can say that um, we call it cybersecurity. Yeah. 
that is definitely one of the major items when you think of uh, safety risks related to uh, to autonomous or also for remotely operated vessels definitely and it's uh, it has to be uh, considered uh, parallel to the actual implementation so mm. uh, yeah it's a definitely risk um, and it's being uh, handled definitely as well mm. um, yeah um, I don't know uh, what more to say. I think it is a, it is a real uh, it is a real risk that uh, it has to be challenged. You can say it's a new new type of of uh, hijackers. Yeah. That, uh, uh, they are a sort of uh, uh, boarding the ship uh, electronically in a way. Yeah. So um, yeah. Uh. But that there are also there is also other challenges when it comes to these type of ships when you have the kind of safety and all, all these issues as of well. Of course, a, a lot of, of challenges related to uh, rules and regulations and also, you can say, legal implications. Mm -hmm. uh, traditional shipping is uh, well regulated today. There is a shipmaster on board uh, who is in command. Uh, uh, who is really in command when you have a remotely operated uh, uh, vessel, for instance. Mm -hmm. And even if you go to to uh, to um, uh, fully autonomous vessels, um, there are uh, IMO regulations related to uh, collision avoidance uh, that uh, you need to implement. Of course, uh, we are <laughs> we are doing steps on the way. You can say mm -hmm. by uh, by implementing uh, what we call the um, 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 situational awareness systems, where some of this is uh, sort of automated the uh, the activities that you normally do on a ship bridge is automated it's like uh, the uh, assistance systems that you have in your car for mm -hmm. doing lane assist and things like that mm -hmm. and and that will of course uh, you can say we are then developing the systems along the way but uh, in addition to that there has to be development on the uh, 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 legislation side mm -hmm. uh, and that is uh, perhaps uh, much slower than technology development yeah, it's a very interesting topic, and I, I think that is a challenge, for instance, University of Bergen should address at some time, the legal aspects, so... Yeah, yeah you can say uh, it is uh, technology meeting, you can say, uh, uh, legal experts, mm. in a way, and, uh, and it's, uh, it has to be sort of a cross-functional uh, uh, team that, uh, that looks into this. Mm. I think we have just a few questions left, or time for a few questions left, and I would like to have a question about the life cycle, and which process of the sh uh, ship's life cycle has the highest emissions, so... Okay, thank you. Uh, I had a look at the question, I do not quite understand. Uh, could uh, someone first elaborate this question? What is the question? Uh, which process was uh, ship's life cycle has the highest? Uh, is it during the use space? Of the exactly. Ship or during the production of the ship? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, yeah. okay. Decommissioning, okay. whatever. I understand. Thank <laughs> you very much, yeah. Okay. Uh, I would say, you know, I, by just look at the, this raw data, that's the uh, ship operating stage, which has the highest emission, where this uh, emission comes from fuel combustions. Uh, from the chimneys, yeah, that's where this emission come from. Uh, that's what I can comment on, yeah. Okay, thank you. thank you. I think we should close because we are approaching our time or have spent our time. So the rest of the question, I think we should just leave. So I would like to thank all of you. And Richard, I suppose you are going to give the closing Comments. Well, so. Well, yes. Uh, well, well. No. Okay. I'll switch tasks. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to uh, sum up here and uh, thank uh, everybody uh, for taking part. Uh, who's standing up along the front here, and uh, Gloria as well, who's sitting down, and uh, also uh, Christian Hans Christian here, who's uh, operated Slido uh, with uh, great professionalism. Very useful tool. Um, 
Yes, thank you there at the back, not least, hiding away. Um, I think it's been a, an informative uh, discussion and uh, presentations here from all. Um, and uh, it's a, a mark of uh, our thanks uh, for people who've come, some have come a long way. We would like to give some uh, a little token, uh, not just words, but uh, a small present. And uh, because you've come from overseas, from uh, you've got something a little bit different, which is a traditional Norwegian tea cheese slice, Osterhovel. <laughs> yes, because you, you've always wanted one of those, haven't you? That's right. How did you get on in life without it? I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, that's uh, it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Norbert, what is it? Uh, it's something to sit on. And it's made from Norwegian wool, as uh, far as I know. And uh, we Norwegians like to go on tour and uh, out in nature. And uh, usually there are a lot of stones or other things to sit on which are quite cold. And uh, this is, uh, keeps you nice and warm when you're out on tour. Even on a deck uh, on a ship that's made of steel, this uh, is much more nicer to sit on. So when I go on a tour, I always have mine uh, with me. So I hope this will be a, a good tour companion for you all, whether you go out in nature or sailing on a ship or whatever. So uh, also from my side, thank you for everyone who uh, came here to either present something, uh, to listen to our speakers, uh, to those who have asked questions. I hope it was interesting for you. And uh, those who want to take a look at our marine lab, the 50 meter wave and towing tank, uh, just gather outside to, uh, the room to the right, uh, and Gloria will lead you uh, down into the basement where the laboratory is. And otherwise, uh, yeah, have a. Uh, you, we can make the presentations available as PDF later. Uh, we will give the uh, uh, speakers a chance to revise them in a way that they are comfortable with, that they will be put online. And I think also the stream will be available as a recording. Um, on the uh, website of the uh, of the seminar or at uh, uib.no slash energy there you can uh, follow the activities at energy lab okay thank you very much have all a safe trip home <laughs> <laughs>